Hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome, bienvenido, uh, to our PVUSD board meeting for Wednesday, September eleventh, two thousand and nineteen. <clears throat> I'm going to ask for somebody to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, okay, Sam, you want to do Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> it's this way, this way, this way, this way. This way, this way. <laughs> okay, ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Okay. Um, hoy tenemos una nueva persona para hacer las <laughs> para traductor lo que alguien quiere decir en en inglés. I mean, en español, en español, no en inglés. <laughs> y esta vez va a ser Alicia, <laughs> Alicia, porque no. No está Virginia, no está Virginia hoy. Entonces tenemos a Alicia que va a hacerlo. Gracias, Alicia. <laughs> ok. Acuérdense, si quieres hablar uh, con, en la agenda, hay que llevar una tarjetita a Eva Amarillo. If you want to speak on an agenda item, you need to fill out a yellow card and give it to Eva. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to give the chance for the superintendent and her comments. Thank you. All right. So thank you. So good evening. So we continue. It will be just a second on that. Um, we continue to have exciting news about our progress and new partnerships here in PVUSD. Um, last Friday, we had the inaugural day for the new Digital Nest PVUSD New School, New School at the Nest Friday program. Um, together, PVUSD and Digital Nest developed and launched a four credit tech learning program for new school students on Friday morning, hosted by Digital Nest. So, seguimos con las noticias excelentes sobre nuestro progreso y también los compañeros um, que tenemos aquí en el distrito. La última viernes tuvimos el primer día de un nuevo programa de la escuela New School que incluye un programa de tecnología en que los estudiantes están recibiendo crédito del Cabrillo College. Um, es, uh, y son todos los todas las mañanas los viernes y está en, um, en el lugar de Digital Nest. And on October 15th, our new partners, the Save the Music Foundation, um, will be hosting a regional convening of foundations and funders, including Pebble Beach um, Foundation, which I just made co connections with on Monday night. Um, to generate interest and support for our new general education, elementary, and secondary music rebuild um, that begins this year in Bradley and Calabasas. So within the next few years, we will have music back in every single elementary school. So el, el 15 de octubre, nuestros nuevos compañeros, um, el Fundación de, de Saval la Música, va a tener una junta, um, un, un, una junta reunión de fundaciones para la gente que quiere apoyar a nuestro objetivo de tener música en todas las escuelas um, primarias. Y ese año va a empezar en las escuelas de Bradley y Calabazas. Y en unos años vamos a tener otra vez um, música en todas um, las escuelas um, de primarias. 
So now I'd like to give up the rest of my time to the Aptos Sports Foundation. The Aptos Sports Foundation has been a significant um, contributor and supporter of our schools, um, specifically in the Aptos area. And we want to give um, recognition to Paul Bailey and the, his group, who he will um, recognize. So, aquí tenemos, vamos, voy a dar lo demás de mi tiempo a la Fundación de Deportes de Aptas. Han dado mucho a nuestras escuelas y la comunidad de Aptas la mayoría del tiempo. Aquí tenemos a Paul Bailey para hacer la presentación. So, welcome up, Paul. There we go. Board President, um, Michelle Rodriguez, um, Superintendent, Joe Dominguez, trustees. I'm here to um, give you a brief update of the Aptos Sports Foundation and then discuss our mutual cooperation agreement that was passed by the board um, two years ago. The, uh, our artwork for our logo was done by uh, the art class at Aptos High School. I gave them, told them they could have a pizza night if they worked and developed our artwork for us. So all year long they fiddled with it and they worked at it and we went and talked to them and that's the artwork the Aptos uh, kids came up for us. And so uh, we nice. think that's fun. Um, my name is Paul Bailey. Uh, I own Bailey Properties Real Estate. I'm a, I have an alumni from Ap 1970 of Aptos High School, the first graduating class. So when I speak about the school and what it's been through and stuff, I've been there since the beginning. You have. Yeah. Um, our first slide, whoop, went the wrong way. How do I get it bigger? All right, our first slide just briefly shares what our purpose is tonight. First, to share our recent accomplishments over the last two years that we've done since, you, since we passed, you passed the, um, um, cooperation agreement with and so of support with the Aptos Sports Foundation. Oh. Um, we've had good successes. It's been a good working relationship. Uh, we've had, we've worked well with the staff and the folks and we've worked out problems and came up with solutions and then good projects were completed at the school with the school district being heavily involved in the process. Um, I'd like to express our gratitude for our public-private working relationship between PVOSD and Aptos Sports Foundation. I honestly think that the future should have more organizations like us that, that stand separate from the district but have a, have a um, working relationship with the district to work out solutions. Because sometimes there's areas that the private industry can come up with solutions and resources that uh, the school district just can't, doesn't have access to. Um, we think a little more entrepreneurially than a lot of times a system like a school district will think. And so that we, we bring the different things to the table because of that. Um, also tonight, we'd like to mutually know if we can reconfirm our declaration of cooperative support and collaboration between PVUSD and ASF. The resolution number approved on June 24th, 2015 by the Board of Trustees. This is um, a little bit of our history, and then I have a page I'm going to read down through to bring it forward. But the Aptos Sports Foundation was created in 1979, was established for the purpose of improving the sports facilities and after-school programs at Aptos High School. At that time, Aptos High School was a nearly new school, unfinished, a nearly new unfinished school with minimum athletic facilities, no alumni support, no connection to the Aptos business community. The original five members saw this and said, geez, let's work on this. That was nine years after I graduated from high school. I got involved in some fundraising projects out there in Aptos, a little helpers golf tournament, some different things, where I, I learned how to do some fundraising activities. But it was so broad-based that nothing was ever fixed, nothing was ever done, the money was spread everywhere. So I wanted to create an organization that was focused on solving something. We really can get something done and move forward. The first baseball field at Aptos High School was bladed in by the Glom family, Glom Eggs. The Glom Egg family came over on a weekend and said, wow, there's no baseball field. So they got brought their tractors and they bladed in the baseball field. That's how that got put in there. The first football field did not have a border around it. It was just sprayed on 
um, grass, you know that blue stuff they spray on dirt? That's what it was, and it grew grass, but it had no edge to it. It just kept growing out like that, and the track was just bladed dirt. That's what was there at Aptos those first couple of years. The pool was like three feet deep. You couldn't dive. It, it was, it, the money got split between a pool and tennis courts, and neither one were done correctly. Um, so, you know, we looked at that and we said, geez, this is something we can all work on. Here's a project. We can develop something. We were asked to be a member of the Boosters Club and to be tied to the school. We decided we wanted to stand totally separate from the school and the district for many reasons, but um, all positive and good reasons. The, um, w there is not, our board of directors has no parent or school employee or administrator on our board of directors. Uh, there are no parents of kids in schools on our board of directors. We are mainly just community people and business people uh, that ha are active in the community. I have folks within our advisory board that are parents and things, but they're not, they're, they're not voters in our organization. We are a nonprofit. We file our taxes. We run our, our, our bookkeeping systems. And uh, there, we have an alumni that is our CPA. We have an alumni that is our attorney. And we're all structured correctly in the state of California. We began in our first year with one golf tournament that made maybe $1,500 with 80 players. Forty years later, we are sold out at $175 per player 30 days before the tournament. We have a second event annually, a poker tournament, each year now that is growing. We see these events now as purely fundraisers, but also we do, we do not see them as purely fundraisers, but we also see them as a way to connect with the community and sell our vision. What began as a fundraising organization has morphed into something more dynamic, a trusted conduit between the community, alumni, and school district. The community knows who we are and trusts us with, our donation, with, with their donations of materials, labor, and funds to accomplish our projects. The Aptos community sees and believes in our vision. Over the last 40 years, we have completed more than four and a half million dollars in improvements at the high school. We scraped the baseball field, we scraped the football field, we scraped the track, and we re rebuilt completely all three of those facilities to being what they are today. And that was us in cooperation with the district working together to complete those projects. But those were privately funded by the Aptos community. Those were not funded by the district. And that's okay, I'm just saying, you know. Um, there is not a program or sports facility to school that we have not improved or touched. We've bought lane lines, wrestling mats, safety equipment. Um, for years, we bought a, we paid for a, a, a sports therapist to half of a sports therapist to travel on the campus to take care of the kids in case they got hurt at an athletic event. And so there's not a program we have not touched. We put lights on the football field and we put lights on the pool ourselves. Our plan is to take Aptos Sports Foundation to a higher level by building an endowment fund now that will be a community funded and owned asset held in the Santa Cruz Community Foundation. Eventually this endowment will fund facilities and programs from Aptos High School for its feeder schools organizations out into the future. We are going to change the future of Aptos. Whoops, I did it again. There you go. Our mission statement, which I think you all should have a copy of also, I gave them. Um, our mission statement is to develop community leaders of tomorrow by providing a quality student athletic experience for the youth of Aptos. Our efforts will increase youth participation in sports by improving and providing quality athletic facilities and programs at Aptos High School, its feeder schools, and sports-related organizations. Building a better student experience through philanthropy is our goal. Our vision is to improve facilities, assets, and improve facility and assist in funding after-school sports activities at Aptos High School, its feeder schools and programs. Our goal is to create a top quality athletic program for the kids in Aptos. As a result, Aptos High School will rival the best schools throughout California, public or private. To accomplish this, we need to build on our current relationship of trust with the community, Aptos community, our alumni, and the Powell Valley School District. An important vehicle that allows Aptos Sports Foundation and district to work together to continue a relationship, to work together to continue a relationship of trust and fill a void that has been caused by current school funding climate is the declaration of support and collaboration. 
Aptos Sports Foundation can be an entrepreneurial partner of the district that utilizes the community skills, resources, and contacts to accomplish projects that are normally encumbered by bureaucracy and state laws. That's now our vision and where we want to go with how we're going to function. You got me again? Well, I did it maybe. Here we go. Um, in the last two years, we installed the water polo scoreboard. Um, the tennis team, we purchased a ball machine and installed benches. And now we're participating in um, resurfacing the tennis courts. The ball machine was fun. At Rio de Mar, um, I mean, we're entrepreneurial. Rio de Mar, we heard that Rio de Mar Tennis Club had bought a new ball machine and the old one was poor. So a, a, we talked with them and one of their folks said, I'll rehab it and you guys take it if you just give us a, uh, a nonprofit number and things. So we ended up with a, brand, a completely rebuilt tennis ball machine, which would have cost $4,000 delivered. And now the kids have a ball machine at the courts to use. Um, we put a video quality scoreboard in the gym. We heard that the Warriors in Santa Cruz uh, were going to change out their scoreboard, thanks to John Marinovich, one of our folks. And uh, we wrote them a letter. John talked with them, and they sent us the scoreboard. We sent them a nonprofit letter. They get a donation. Aptos has a new scoreboard put up. Um, the marquee sign uh, was purchased and installed with cooperation between us and the district. The baseball fencing and dugout improvement, baseball scoreboard was repaired, and the golf cart for sports therapist was purchased. We've done that in the last two years with our, with our agreement of cooperation. Um, at the end, I need to introduce who's with me, so I'm going to keep rolling here. Um, some of the projects we're coming up with now, we're coming to. One of them we're just starting to work on um, is the Mar Vista field renovation. Wendy Smith, um, a parent out there, she's wanted to have this happen. She's very much into the fundraising. She's tonight at a fundraising event uh, with a group of people that have funds for these types of projects. But uh, she would like to have us, f underneath our umbrella with our cooperation support as a team, the Sports Foundation is going to assist her in working through this project out there at Mar Vista. Uh, right now it gets muddy, it doesn't drain well. She would like a field that more kids can play on a uh, week around and they can do soccer practice and things on weekends and more kids can come out and play and improve the school. Something we've been working on for a time you know, um, Dilfer Field, we, we built that, we built Dilfer Field for about 1.1. And that was the, um, the field, the tur turf, the drainage, everything there. And we did that for about 1.1. And, um, but when Trent gave us about 500,000, which is a very generous man back there, then we raised the rest through the community. Um, Granite Construction was very generous, and so were other people in helping us pull that off. Granite Construction did the work for almost half the cost uh, that they would normally charge. This is the, I guess, the north end of the field, and we're putting in something that's called a crow's nest. It's going to be another entrance. This is a drawing from the architect from some time ago. It has uh, changed slightly from this, but uh, there are a set of steps go up, and then kids can sit on the benches or stand on all those areas and watch the game. Right now, that's where a lot of the kids stand is that whole end between the snack shack and around that end of the field, they stand during games. So we're going to improve that whole end. We've been working with um, your um, maintenance departments. They've uh, approved, they've seen the drawings, they've been through engineers, they've been back and forth, um, and they're getting ready to go. They've been up to the State Department of Architecture already, and uh, we're getting, you know, we're moving that through the process with the cooperation of the district and as a team. That's, so that's coming up. We're very proud um, with the 50th anniversary of Aptos High School. The Sports Foundation is going to do a 50th year gala at the Seascape Resort. Um, it's going to be a really a cool event. We're bringing back alumni that have done very well in their life to talk about the benefits of youth sports and mentorship and leadership and what it teaches them in life. Um, and ex our, our MC is... Um, Samantha Shocker, she was an All-American backstroker at Aptos, All-American um, freestyler and, and, and backstroker at Aptos. She went to UCLA. Now she's a newscaster, I believe, for Fox in Austin, Texas. Wonderful gal, very talented woman, but she's going to be our MC for the evening. 
um, a young man named, you know, he's 40 something, but uh, Matt Rogers, he's currently a Lieutenant Colonel General or something of a platoon in the Army. He left Aptos after playing four years of football, went to West Point, played four years of football for the Army, and then he now has been in the Army. He's already taught at, at uh, um, um, he's already taught at West Point, I guess, and then he's already been in the Pentagon. He's been to Afghanistan three times and Iraq. His platoon has been over there and he, his charge several times. And uh, now he's, they're taking him back. He needs to go back to West Point to teach again. And they're going to park him there until they need him some other day. But he's going to come in uniform, late 40s, and stand and talk about how mentorship and, um, um, and, and a good coaching and athletic programs, that what it meant to him in his life, and how he can see young people handle themselves better under stress, uh, stressful situations, because they have that background to pull on. So it's going to be a really wonderful thing. Um, Mark Monty and, and uh, Mark Holcomb of the resort and Deluxe, we're going to make them honorary alumni because of everything they've, do they've donated to that school has been huge numbers. The Snack Shack, literally, they go to Mark's back door, Deluxe, and they get what they want. And I think he charges them his cost. And uh, he's very generous with that, the our Snack Shacks and everything at the high school. Um, so we're going to make them honorary alumni. It's going to be a wonderful event. It's going to be a very Aptos event. And um, we're looking forward to that. At that event, we'll begin to sell our endowment fund and the vision of where the Sports Foundation wants to go in the future. Excuse so me, real sir? quick, I'm so glad you didn't start that clock because my so we're padre's we're in the back. back we're right we're at, time. Just to let you know you're at 15 minutes. I have 15 minutes more? You've been at, you've been at 15. I'm get, that's what they told me I would do. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, Danny Braga and John Marinovich and Tra Travis Fox and Peggy Pugh are here, here with us tonight, and they're our support. And, um, we could not get a project through without John Murdovich. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vice President Daniel Dodge. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, that was great. Wonderful to hear about all those great things. Woo! Um, make this. A little bit jealous in other high schools. <laughs> we don't have somebody like him. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to have governing board comments now. So do you want to start with Georgia? Uh, good evening. Welcome, everyone. Um, I just want to make a quick announcement, reminder that the county fair started today, and it runs through this Saturday. Um, I also wanted to take a moment and um, reflect that today is Patriots Day in remembrance of all the victims of 9-11 who lost their lives or were harmed in these horrific domestic terror attacks 18 years ago today. In reflecting on this, I observed that many of our graduating high school seniors were born the year of this horrific tragedy and are not aware of events from firsthand knowledge from that day. Additionally, this caused me to reflect on um, thinking about the massive increase that we have seen in domestic terror since 9-11-2001 across public and workplaces, social places, churches and synagogues, as well as in our schools. So I'd like to ask Board President Trustee Osmondson um, that we could have a moment of silence to recognize all the victims of these domestic terror tragedies and attacks, as well as to recognize the men and women of our law enforcement, our emergency personnel throughout this country, and the men and women of our military who serve and protect, and many of whom have given the ultimate sacrifice in doing so. Okay, Jennifer Tractor. <laughs> I'm just going to pass to keep us on time. Thank you. Um, I was able to attend multiple back to school nights. It's really wonderful to you know to attend you know these events. I went to a Renaissance um, High School, Rio de Mar Elementary, and Aptos High, and just hearing from you know parents and teachers about the progress that this district is making is very heartening. 
Um, I also attended the first preseason home game for the Aptos High football team. Great to see our community come to support our students. The S SELPA Community Action Committee had our first meeting at the s of the school year. We reviewed the resources and rights that families have in our district. I encourage um, anyone who has an interest in special education to come to these meetings. Um, finally, I attended the uh, Intergovernmental Committee meeting where in addition to discussing joint use of facilities, we looked at various community safety issues such as school traffic plans, school threat assessments, a public safety tax measure, and quality, water quality issues. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's been a couple busy weeks for the Powell Valley Education Foundation in preparation for our fundraiser tomorrow. So at Heli Schools Restaurants, if you haven't purchased these tickets, you can still do that. Um, the fundraiser starts at 5.30. We'll have a silent auction, some introductory uh, remarks from different folks, and um, amazing student performances. So I look forward to seeing you there. I also encourage our fellow Board of Trustees to purchase your tickets online. We do want to make sure that this foundation is um, uh, funded, self-funded, um, so your support is critical in making sure that happens. Yeah, and oh yes, and tickets would also be sold at the door. Okay. <laughs> I'm also looking forward to the Musica and El Corazon music event at the Plaza. Again, we will have student performances. It's a nice way to showcase PBSD youth talent. So if you're able to join us, that will be on September 19th. Um, also, as of August 28th, 948 of our teachers um, have utilized their 125 stipends for materials. That's a total of $118,500 going back straight into our classrooms. So I do want to take our, uh, thank our fellow Board of Trustees for supporting this initiative. We received nothing but positive feedback so far. And lastly, tomorrow morning, I will be meeting with Patricia Mata from the PBPSA Empower Watsonville Youth Service Learning Group to discuss how we can support their efforts in having the city of Watsonville adopt a local law that prohibits the sale of tobacco products at pharmacies as an attempt to decrease the impact we've seen from vaping and flavored tobacco in our community. So this would be a good item for our next intergovernmental committee meeting. And I'm glad to see our mayor here. Uh, so hopefully we can um, start that discussion. Um, and so with that, thank you for joining us tonight and have a great rest of the week. President Osmondson. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. Kim DeSerpa, I represent um, the Aptos Schools and want to thank the Aptos Sports Foundation for not just the generosity, but the hard work and dedication you've given to our students over the years. My daughter was a student athlete at Aptos High, recent graduate, and is running now for New Mexico and benefited from a lot of the work that went into that field. So I want to thank you very much for the beautiful presentation tonight and your continued efforts to improve um, our schools in general. Thank you. The Mar Vista plans look amazing. Yeah. Um, I myself was um, a volunteer at Valencia Elementary and put in their track by myself, put in essentially all the um, playgrounds there. I raised all the money all by myself and did all the, prog the, the, the management, the project management of those things. So I know how hard it is sometimes to work with the bureaucracy, the district, and get things accomplished. So. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, so I was able to go to some open houses, including Valencia's, where I was able to give an address to the parents and staff there. And um, I want to thank Karen Lane for uh, granting me that opportunity. I love the start of the year. It just reminds all of us up here what's important and what, why we're up here to make things better for the kids and the families in this community. Um, I was at the school board association meeting on Monday um, with all the other trustees. Um, including the county trustees in, um, in our area. And I, it's always very eye-opening to hear what struggles other districts are having. And um, I was able to happily report all the wonderful things that are happening here uh, at PVUSD. We have a razzle-dazzle superintendent that's bringing a lot of notoriety and opportunity into our district. Um, and so thank you, Michelle, for all your hard work. Dr. Rodriguez, thank you. On October 11th, we'll be having, um, what are we calling it? A state of the district breakfast and Aptos Sports Foundation. If you got uh, anybody out here who hasn't been to that breakfast, I um, would like to invite you to see it because it's 
amazing. It's a huge pep rally um, with Michelle, with Dr. Rodriguez giving a presentation um, with video, and not just PowerPoint, but like live video feed of all the amazing uh, changes and innovation that's happening in this district. So I would love to see all of you there. So thank you very much. What time does it start? And where is it? So it's at the Watsonville Community Room and it starts at 9 o'clock on October 11. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. I'm excited for another school year. I'll just keep my comments brief. Um, I attended open house for Mini White, Radcliffe, Watsonville High School. I'm still waiting for E.E. E. Hall. I also crossed into a landmark with the mayor. Sorry about that. Um, so it, it, it was it was good to see. Excited kids are excited. Um, I'm also excited for the fair. I know Watsonville High has a couple pigs that are going to be out there. So check them out. Um, thank you very much, Aptos High Foundation, for coming. Uh, the Mr. Mayor is a 99 year graduate of Aptos High School. Oh, one. And um, I would also like to see Watsonville and Aptos play again for football. I, I thought that was a great rivalry. I think that's something we lost when uh, you know the divisions were moved around, but I, I would eventually like to see something like that. One year at Aptos, one year at Watsonville, I, I think it was great. Thank you very much. Okay, and I'm um, Karen Arvinson, and um, I was able to go to, believe it or not, two of my schools were on the same night. Not good. But um, I was able to go to both of them. I just found out which school was going to have their open house for a longer period of time. And so I went to the one that was shorter first. And then so Ohlone and Hall District were on the same night. I, I went to Ohlone and with the cafeteria. But I was able to go to every single classroom and saw every single teacher. And then from there, I went to Hall District. And I did have enough time still to go to every single classroom say hi to every single teacher, which is pretty good, because um, theirs was until 8 o'clock, <laughs> a little bit longer. Um, then I went to the Radcliffe open house, and they didn't have the cafeteria thing. They were just in the um, rooms, so I was able to go to every single room and see every single teacher. Um, and that same night with them, too, I went to um, a meeting for the Migrant Head Start, same night. Um, <coughs> And in their meeting, um, there, there was a governance meeting, and they talked about you know all the important things they do for governance, school board administrators, and the committee, um, the policy committee. Um, and then they talked about the requirements for eligibility for their program. Every family has to come with documents. And right now, for example, in their in Migrant Head Start, there are 33% of the families are indigenous, indigenous. And uh, there are actually five languages spoken. Uh, the largest one is, of course, Misteco um, Alto, I think, Alto, right? Um, uh, but there's also Misteco Bajo, there's Zapoteco, there's Trique, and there's Purepecha. <laughs> <laughs> five languages spoken. Um, and they talked about what their priorities were going to be. Um, and what we're trying to do in Migrant Head Start is open up more space for migrants that do not move from place to place, because obviously it's really hard for migrants to move, especially from Mexico to here. Um, so we w we would love we were we're working very hard to create more space for my migrant farm workers who are here staying here. Um, and the only thing I last thing I wanted to say <laughs> that um, I I was able to go to the San Francisco Mime Troupe Theater. They're, they do they've been doing political theater for sixty years. Sixty years they've been doing political theater. It's pretty cool. Um, that was in Santa Cruz at the San Lorenzo Park. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, there is going to be one student still. Um, the students 
our high school student board re representatives are still selecting their people who are going to be representatives for our board, and, and that's going to happen soon, like maybe even tomorrow. But um, I think there's one student here, Pajaro Valley High School. So if, if she or he could come up, or, or two of you could come up. All right, <laughs> there's two of you. <laughs> nice to have you both. Hello. Good evening, board members and fellow peers. My name is Andrew Lorente, the ASB vice president. And I'm Adam Tingonin, the ASB president. And we are the student representatives from Pajara Valley High School for this school year. First is about going to be. Chest work, please. Yeah. We're both seniors. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> First is about going to is going to be about our athletics. During the Greenland football game two Fridays ago, we were able to witness an intense surprise when our Grizzly football team were tied 7-7 seven to seven with Watsonville High a couple minutes prior to halftime. While we ended up losing 21-7, to seven, we were still able to win the Spirit Cup once again, adding to our streak of four years in a row. Hence, it was worth the loss of our voices for many of us the following day. And then furthermore, the girls' tennis team have been working really hard to win their matches. Yesterday, all of the girls won their matches, which prompted them to have a quick but fun celebration at the food court of Costco, where it keeps the cost low. Additionally, whenever I have watched them practice, several of the new members of different grades seem they were properly taken care of by the veteran players of the team. Our girls' volleyball team has also been training new players to adapt to positions and plays that are crucial to perform properly during games. By spectating them during a game last Thursday against Monterey High, sadly they lost, I was able to witness the hearts the players had for one another and the game, especially when crucial mistakes were made. Lastly, starting tonight until su Sunday night, our student athletes will have a special team bonding experience by helping out the community with doing a cleanup service at the annual Santa Cruz County Fair. Now on to, ac now on to academics. Recently, we have started using a program called the Five Star, which encourages students to maintain a positive behavior. A device is used to scan students' and teachers' IDs to build up a chance to re win rewards such as a homecoming ticket, PV gear, a yearbook, and other prizes. As a result of this new innovation, more teachers are now participating, providing a good example for the students. There was a strong morale booster for ASB's continuous hard work. From this, knowing that we can continue to strive for more spirit from not only the students, but the teachers as well. Along with our new teachers, new classes were also implemented this school year too. One highly uh, unexpected being the IT Essentials class, a class that I did not expect to be so versatile with computer science. We not only have the opportunity to learn about software and the various models of computers, but we also get to invest heavy amount of minutes on the anatomy of computers, fixing them and also phones, and learning how to code as well. For an assignment, a controversial discussion occurred within the economics and government classes for seniors due to the debate about a heart transplant. But it was hypothetical, so it's not um, dangerous. But students were encouraged to take a position with their own arguments between five people of different backgrounds. It was an interesting experience since division among the students was witnessed as they were all engaged with the topic. It was also fun to see a simple vignette of the people we have never met in this class. Now to activities. With the 10 plus new teachers on our campus, we have tried to make them feel as welcome as possible through an assortment of activities from our first spirit week. While we did this, we continued to focus on getting as many students as possible to participate with the spirit days and lunch activities as much as we could. The title of the week was WOW Week, which stands for Week of Welcome. One of the themes was Squad Day and it showcased the unity our leaders had as well as several groups of friends and teachers. Personally, I enjoyed the science department who all dressed up with lab coats. Yeah, and those, uh, we labbed it. As spoken about earlier with winning the Spirit Cup for the Green In game in exchange for weaker voices the next day, we specifically saw students cheering loudly who we did not expect who would reach uh, such ranges. We continued to try and rally as many students to remain standing the whole game, except when injuries would happen. We also printed the chance on paper to pass out to have as much participation as possible for the game. It was loads of work, but it was all worth it for the Grizzly Pride. We hope our school will continue to build towards greater unity with the activities and plans we ASB have for them. And lastly, I hope our campus of Grizzlies will continue to be fierce to strive out to get out of their comfort zones for the greater good of not only ourselves, but for others around. 
Thank you all for listening. It was fun to have a few minutes of our cardiovascular systems pumped up due to our nervousness. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. How's Melvin? <laughs> Thank you so much for your contribution to our knowledge about Pado Valley High School. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to have, uh, not s a little bit more boring, <laughs> approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Hopefully 7-0. And here's the approval of the minutes for the August 21, 2019 board meeting. Can I have a motion? Making a motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? We have one, one abstention. 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 One abstention. So six, six zero, zero one. one. Okay, now we're gonna have a little public hearing. So I have to do this little thing. Knock, 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 public hearing. <laughs> and it's gonna be Joe Dominguez. And it's, yeah, 6.1. We're gonna approve a resolution adopting school facility needs analysis and update of level two development mitigation fees. Resolution number 192005. So this item is the um, public hearing uh, resolution to uh, provide level two developer fees um, and the uh, study. <laughs> I think you should come up here, right up to the front. Because the TV likes to see you up there too. <laughs> All right, so we have a PowerPoint, but um, we completed the level two uh, developer fee justification study. And um, so this is done on an annual basis. And uh, developer fee basics is the, it's a common source uh, of funding to pay for our local facility needs. Um, as you know, most districts in our state collect level one developer fees. Uh, so we are in a, sh a very small group of districts that cl are able to collect level two developer fees. And I'll explain here in a little bit why we're able to do that. Uh, the current maximum rate for level one is $3.79 uh, for residential projects and 61 cents for commercial and industrial, uh, industrial projects within um, our district. As I mentioned, some districts are able to qualify for level two um, and is determined individually uh, for each district to fund 50% of the needed new facilities to the impact of new development. And so it's specific to the new development within the community. Uh, the qualifications to even uh, apply for level two uh, is uh, four main factors and you have to meet two of the four. So 20% of the teaching stations uh, in a district have to be within portables and we are at 36%, uh, so we qualify there. 30% of your K, uh, six students must be a multi-year uh, round schedule. Uh, we do not meet that criteria uh, factor. Your existing capital facility debt is over 15% uh, of our local bonding capacity, and we meet that uh, at 46.4%. And uh, the last uh, qualification, the district has placed a local bond on the ballot in the past four years, which received at least 50% of the votes. Uh, and that's within the time, time frame of four years, so we don't meet that one. But we do meet two out of the four with the check, mark or the check next to the bullet point. The major factors uh, impacting level two fee amounts is the average square footage uh, new homes built within the district, and that's about 1,600 square feet the local land costs, and then what is the yield rate of a new housing unit? So based on 1,600 square feet, uh, level two is 0.44 uh, students out of that home. And then the space available in existing schools, uh, which is no space, 
and then local uh, funds available for new facilities. The study determines the maximum amount the district is allowed to charge based on that formula. And so it's a combination of all of those and that's how it's determined. Uh, impact example, and this is from a uh, previous presentation, the board requested an example. Um, so we took the current information that we have. So uh, here at, in our district, uh, a home of 1,600 square feet provides 0.44 students. The average cost uh, based on the state standards and the formula is $41,006. The 50% share uh, uh, for developer fees or impact just for one new home is $9,134. So uh, at a 1,600 square foot home, $5.57, uh, a new home would pay $9,140.37. Or if we maintain our current level two fee of 547, it's $8,976.27. Over the next five years, um, the, 10 percent, the 10 cent increase to our level two developer fees would bring in $2.97 million. Uh, if we maintain it at the current rate, then we are at $2.91 million. Uh, regulations require the fee to be set per square foot, as I mentioned previously, um, and it's in addition to anything uh, to a home, an older home, or new construction over 500 square feet. Uh, so that's the determining factor. So if it's under 500 square feet, the level two does not impact. And how can we use level two developer fees as new school projects, um, furniture, site acquisition, uh, architect fees, uh, playgrounds, et cetera. And or we can use to lease and purchase portables uh, and modulars throughout our district. And we can also expand our existing school sites, uh, classrooms, cafeterias, parking, uh, playgrounds, et cetera. One of the uh, main factors that uh, as a district that we also look into and this also rolls into our state formula for Prop 51 funding or a new state bond uh, that the legislature is looking at is 369 of our 1,060 classrooms, which is 34% qualify or eligible for modernization. And 713 square feet of our district's 1.8 million square feet is eligible for modernization and the state building program. And that's about 39.6. Um, an eye-opener was 382 of our 1,060 classrooms, 36% are in portables. Um, and then one significant um, fact is the average age of all our permanent buildings is 45 years old, and the average age of our portable buildings is 22 years of age. And that uh, piece for our portables, some have an expectancy of 20 to 25 years, and some, the new modern ones are 30. So definitely that's a, a issue for our district. But how are we using the funds? So uh, here is a uh, recap or summary of what we've done. For portable classrooms, Lakeview, we have three, McQuitty one, Aptos Junior one, our transportation department, and Diamond Tech. Uh, most recently, playground modernization, Mar Vista playground, and then we are under uh, in the process right now for our girls softball field at Watsonville High School, and that's underway. We have classroom modernization that's been completed at Starlight and McQuitty, and those were roofing projects, and Valencia was a classroom. Our SELPA classroom modernization, uh, Aptos High School, which um, I would like to inform the board that at the September 25th board meeting, we'll have Maddie uh, Architects contract on the I agenda for the uh, modernization of room 107. And currently what we're doing, internal facilities planning uh, internally is Rolling Hills room 25. So those two SELPA expansion, uh, due to the uh, enrollment or impact of SELPA, we're able to use developer fees to make adjustments at those um, locations. So I'm excited to show the money is being put to good use. Joe, yeah. while you're on that last slide, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So <clears throat> these particular projects were paid for so solely out of de the developer fees that we received? Yes. Okay. So none of these came out of the bond? No, these are not bond okay, uh, thank projects. You. And we will bring a uh, uh, Mr. Beecher and our bond oversight committee at a later uh, point in time. We'll be coming back to give a bond project update 
and then also have a de uh, developer fees project update and have it summarized for the whole board. So in summary, uh, level two study increases residential residential rates immediately once board approved. Approximately in the next five years, it's $2.97 million um, that'll provide help um, in the various um, projects that we have district-wide, um, from playgrounds to play fields to classrooms, uh, whether it's expansion or SELPA, um, and covers the programs that impact our students. And residential fees can be increased by up to 10, do, uh, 10 cents, which is a 1.8 increase. And once again, level two um, study expires in 12 months. So the study is continuous every 12 months, um, and that's based on development. I'd also like to inform the board January of 2020, I'll be coming back with our level one study and adjustment. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, so we're looking at, are there any public comments, Dana? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Is there any board comments? Thank you for getting those girls softball fields done. It's been a while. Thank you. Anything you want to? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so these fees are sort of lodged on top of whatever permitting fees the county charges. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So it, it ends up um, being passed on to the homeowner, really all of these developer fees, because the developer isn't paying them. They're being passed on to the consumer. It depends on low-income housing development is a different um, structure. Right. Uh, Non-low-income development, yes. It's, it's mm -hmm. structured within the fees that they pay. So for somebody who wants to remodel a home and add on square footage, then they're also going to, they pay that higher level of Correct. developer fee, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. And, and as long as, uh, as long as the expansion or modernization of the home so if they're adding on a bedroom or a portion of a garage or etc over 500 square feet so if okay. it's under then the fees don't kick in georgie um i have a, a just a couple of questions so your slide where you were talking about the average age of the portables i think you cited 22 on that yes and then you had mentioned when you were speaking um, something about between 20 and 25 30 years depending upon newer portables older folder rules and and it just struck something in me to inquire with you about because and I'm not even sure you were here yet at the time but a few years ago um, we, the district was approached by the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors to put a portable at Lakeview Middle School for an after school program that was going to be accessible and usable to our students during the day. And one of the biggest reasons of its rejection at that time was the age of portables. So I'm a bit confused. N now, you know, I'm hearing. 25 years is the average life for an older one, 30 years is the average life for a newer one, and this one wasn't even in that near that category. So that's just, and, then and I the don't even know you were here at that time, so I'm I not can't putting that on you, but. Yeah, I can't speak I mean, Dr. Rodriguez could probably speak to that because I'm sure the, she might. To the Lakeview piece, but I can speak to that the uh, modulars are, it's more difficult to remove a modular and replace it at another site. Portables are very easy to relocate. Mm -hmm. It's the, the date of production. Correct. So it could be at, um, say, Watsonville High School, and it could be there for 10 years. And you see a decrease or increase in enrollment, you need to move that portable to Aptos High. Well, the clock is ticking, so that's 10 years, but the life expectancy is probably another 10 years. And so the condition of that portable, so maybe at Lakeview it was the condition or the age of that portable. Mm -hmm. I'm not yeah. sure, but. No. So in regards to the Lakeview portable, one, when, because uh, it's not our program, it's the UCSC's program. When UCSC um, for Girls Paving the Way contacted the county, they actually confirmed that they did not need a portable. 
and that they would use our kitchen program. They later on changed that program completely so they didn't even need our kitchen space. But the main caveat was that was that they were requesting that the district provide the portable, which would have been about six hundred thousand dollars, which is what it cost us. But they were willing to share a portion of that cost. That's what we were uh, being offered in the grant. One hundred thousand dollars of the six hundred thousand dollars. Yes. Okay. So we still would have. And it would have been ours to access during day use. It, it would have been, but we at that time and we still to this day we didn't have the half a million that we needed. We really, frankly, didn't even get to that point because the county decide, told UCSC that they did not need it. Um, when I spoke to UCSC the following day, they said that they weren't even told that they needed that portable, and because it's their program, they engaged the county, and the county said that they did not need it. Um, and then later on, they pulled the program completely. Um, so frankly, we didn't even get to the point where we asked the board if they wanted to try to find the half a million somewhere because um, they didn't need the portable. Okay. Um, so, and then, I, you know, and I'm, I, I also find it a bit concerning, and, and just to just correct this, um, and, and I, I think you did a well um, job in addressing um, Trustee DeSerpa's comment, um, not all. In it, from a business perspective, not all additional fees necessarily get passed on to the customer and the end consumer and end user in this sense being a, a property owner who would purchase the property. So I appreciate you handling that correctly that yes, the developers could absorb part of this cost and you know it goes into other areas of you know cost of rising and inflation in the community locally as well. The other thing that I found um, a bit concerning, and this is probably not really directed to you, but maybe to our agenda setting committee, is that usually when we have a public hearing matter, it's kind of been board practice in the past that we would have a public hearing and then at the next board meeting that item would be brought back to be voted on. I, my question is, why are we having a public hearing on this matter tonight and it being voted on as the first item in our agenda instead of it being brought back at our next board meeting? So this is the this is what we have done year after year. We're required by law to do the public hearing. Um, it's according to the topic of which it is. So, for example, budget and LCAP, which occurs in May, we do bring back the next time, and that's um, Ed Code required. We have actually significant. Um, public hearings that we do that we do the exact um, we do that action item on the exact same night so it's really based on ed code in this case um, ed code doesn't ask for the bifurcation and so therefore we do not do it um, when it's required such as LCAP and budget then we do do that where it it's a delay but in this case um, for the last well for as long as um, I'm aware of, we have always done this at the exact same time for this action item. Okay, thanks for the elaboration. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Joe. So I'm gonna do, 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 public hearing is over. Okay, we're gonna do visitor non-agenda items. We have some. For 7.1, we have Bill Beecher. Good evening, Bill Beecher. Uh, I'm here as chair of the Citizens Oversight Committee. Um, during the recent EA Hall field discussions, there were some irregularities that came up that Joe was able to pull out. And so I, the board needs to know about them because you were left out of some decision making, and I'll address that. Um, in 2016, about a half a million dollars was diverted from the funds that were supposed to go to the field to cover the uh, Gen 7 portables that were going in because they had come up short. Uh, I thought that was a good business decision at the time, uh, but I disagreed with how it was handled. Um, the thinking at the time was the field's gonna cost less than the $3.8 million that had originally been put in the fund. Um, the problem is no one was told about it. 
Uh, I've talked to several trustees and myself, and nobody remembers this ever being brought to the board or to the Citizens Oversight Committee. And this was taking place at a time when we were going through a grand jury deal, which had to do with transparency, uh, especially on our financial matters and oversight. And so it's kind of like, oh, gee, this is not good. Then um, having looked into it, it, there appears to be a loophole in our procedure. And I will come back uh, with a proposal, uh, an agendized uh, item, to um, suggest a change, a modification of the present uh, system. Uh, now, subsequent to 2016, another 300000 or so was moved out of the fund uh, to cover other expenses. And that left uh, too little money to be able to do the track and the field both. And, uh, and so um, I felt bad for EA Hall. They aren't getting what we said we were going to do with Measure L. Uh, and so uh, I will be back with how I think we can correct what has happened because you guys should have had a chance to vote. It's not clear it should have gone to the COC, but you as a minimum should have had uh, that. Now, can I clarify anything? Cheap shot of trying to get discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Francisco Estrada. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Board President Osmondson, uh, Board of Trustees. First off, I apologize for my outfit. I was at the gym when I <laughs> came by. And uh, I just simply wanted to thank. Uh, Trustee Daniel Dodge Jr. for inviting me to a couple of uh, back to school nights. Uh, it meant a lot to me to go back to my old elementary school, H.A. Hyde, just to uh, see the teachers and the students. And uh, very emotional, but I just wanted to thank the board, the board of trustees, for all the great work that you're doing. And uh, Maria, y you know, I'm more than happy to, to get uh, to work together and we'll, we'll get a ban or we'll, we'll, we'll pass some good laws, some good legislation. And uh, I'm here to work with, with all of you. And um, the other thing I, I wanted to say, and it's a little bit overdue, but I wanted to thank Dr. Michelle Rodriguez and Joe Dominguez for the, uh, and the board for the uh, Mexico en el Corazón event. I know it was a few months ago, but uh, we put that together in a short amount of time. I, I'm grateful for your willingness to work with the city. and. Uh, on behalf of the city council and the, and the city of Watson, we'll just know that we are we want to work with you and we want to be supportive in, in whatever we can do to uh, help our students and our families and our teachers and our unions and, our, and everyone. So thank you. we're going to our unions, Pado Valley Federation of Teachers. I, I saw Nellie here. There she is. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Um, I realized last time I was here, I didn't say good evening, so I had a note for myself to greet you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I... I don't want to spend too much time talking about unaudited actuals, but I did look over unaudited actuals, and um, I noticed what I did was I compared the unaudited actuals to what the board had adopted last summer just to see that variance, well, that difference, because I think that that matters. Um, but one of the things that was most interesting is that the revenues that had been projected um, from last summer for this, this last 18-19 school year and what the actuals were, it, it was an increase of $11.5 million, but the spending all increased by $17.5 million. Um, and a big portion of that was in services and other operating expenses, so um, that's something that I had um, already asked Joe to help me understand as to where is this money going. Um, okay, so that's just a quick note on, on audit actuals. I don't want to talk numbers anymore. 
but in other ways, talking about these. Uh, a couple of items, or one item on the agenda, it's, it's two pieces, but one of the items on the agenda tonight is um, to split a position in um, which I know in the presentation it's going to say that's bond funded. There is a little, there is a small portion coming from the general fund. But it's, it's the rationale that really caught me. And it says it's to ensure more effective and efficient oversight of planning and implementation systems that support safe and orderly learning environments conducive to student achievement. That's a lot of what we're asking for. <laughs> and so, um, so it's, it's interesting to me that another administrative position would be created for that, which could fund a teacher's position. Um, and we, there are still teachers that are needed. So, and we could, because we are looking for the in-classroom safe learning effective environment. So, you know, we have, and we have been busy since before the school year started. We have been busy representing members who are asking for that support. So, um, and recently we've been working with a group of temporary status teachers who work in the early childhood education department and they, they work in a seasonal uh, preschool setting. They, we, we've had this program for many years and recently, uh, well, a couple of years ago, the district decided to give a letter that d was very damaging and created um, a nightmare for many of these women who work in this program that were seeking to s supplement as they work, as they looked for other work because this is a temporary job and they were not able to um, receive EDD, well, unemployment, there, so there was an issue with that. This year, a letter went out again. And these are women who are dedicated to the program, love being preschool teachers, have worked really, really hard to maintain their permits and um, return every year to work in this program. They're established, families know them, families request them, and they are, um, in my opinion, easily exploited. And they, you know, so they are. So we've, we're working with human resources to have this letter rescinded because their contract is very, very clear in that their contract is temporary. So there is no need for a letter that tells them that they've been terminated. And especially a letter that cites education code that is given by a certain time in the season because essentially they were all terminated, which what that does, it takes away that automatic right to return. So there is, because they're temporary status, the language that we have in our contract to protect, to protect them and when they come back um, is very limited and that's what we have for them because of um, their status. So we hope that um, you are um, able to be sympathetic to this group of teachers and um, are able to work with us in assuring that, our, that they don't have to continue this every year um, of having to fight off a letter that could be damaging to them and their benefits. Thank you. Okay, California School Employees Association, are they here? I don't see any of you. <coughs> Is there? Is somebody can come? You don't want to come up? <laughs> say, just come up and say hi to us? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <coughs> let's see. And the other ones are Pavam. There's no uh, managers that would like to get up here? One of you, Puka, come on. Over. Somebody. No? Okay. <laughs> and nobody wants to say anything? 
There you go. We got somebody to come up here. Yay. Okay, introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Gus Paws. I'm a maintenance specialist for the district, so I guess I'll be speaking on behalf of the CSEA. Um, we're pretty okay. excited to get the year started. Um, we are um, working on trying to get the schools up and making them safe for our students and for our um, teachers, uh, clerks, and office staff uh, people. Building, working in as parents, uh, mentors, and and leaders in the office, and the kitchen staff working hard. <clears throat> I don't know why I'm choking right now. <laughs> and our kitchen staff getting food ready for our for our students to have good meals, and just excited about the year and making it safe and and a healthy place for the students and the staff. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Okay, now I can save up for them again. And lastly is 8.4, Communication Workers of America. I've never seen him here. <laughs> okay, we're gonna start with our action items. <laughs> and we're gonna now vote on what Joe Dominguez talked to us about. So we're gonna actually now approve resolution 1920.05 adopting school facility needs analysis and update of level two, development mitigation fees. And so, you know, trustee, I don't know if you Trustee Osmondson, can I, can I just make a suggestion? Yeah. Um, I know that we've already approved our agenda, but what I would like to do is move 10.2, which is our report on special education. I'd like to move that up, if we could, before our action items, because we have a child here in the audience who's oh, sort of okay. waiting, I think, for that presentation. So if that's okay with the rest of the board, I think that would be a good thing to do now. Okay. Is that okay with Heather Gorman? So, so I'd like to move to make an move. amendment in the approval of our agenda to yeah. move 10.2 up to what? To 9.1. Before 9.1, um, before that's what the motion. It, there is also an item in the consent agenda regarding special ed, so I don't know if anyone who's here in regards to that on item 11.6. Well, well, I think in the interest if we're gonna be moving them, that we should just move them in tandem together. Just given the audience in here too. Okay, so I'll amend my motion to um, move 10.2 and 11.6 to before action items. Okay, second. we're moving it. Mm -hmm. That means that we, right we're now. voting on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. first and second. Did we already have a first and second? Yeah, oh, we did. Oh, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Seven zero. Thank you. And I'm sorry I didn't catch that earlier. Good evening, President Osmondson, Dr. <laughs> Rodriguez, board, cabinet, audience. I'm very excited and proud to be here as the Special Services SELPA Director. Um, we have a presentation for you tonight, and it's really focused on some of the things that we have been hearing and concerns that have come our way and looking at what we're doing in special services to support our children. Looking at this, we really want to build a strong foundation in special services, and how we're doing that is working with general education in order to build that foundation. Like any foundation that you have, you have to build it strong at the bottom to support the things at the top. And our special education students are the people, or the students that are coming up to the top that need that extra support. Um, we are no longer willing to wait for them to fail. So we want to support them right at the first. So this is our ed code, but I'm going to go on to the next slide here because really what we need to do, and ed code you can read through that, but what I wanted to present to you today is that we have to have specifically designed instruction and related services that are, that's unique to the educational needs of every student that qualifies for special education. 
we have a full continuum of programs and options, and then we have to present that within the least restrictive environment. And within the least restrictive environment, that means that as much as we can, we support the students in general education classrooms. And even at our IEP meetings now, and you may not know this, that we have to talk about the harmful effects of pulling a student out of a general education into a special classroom. And we just talk about the fact that it's they're not being educated with their same age peers. And so how does that support the student? And a lot of times the programs that we are building do support the students, but at times we really need to look at how we keep them in the general education class. So for our district, zero to 21 is are the number or the age range that we provide special education services. So we have post-secondary and zero to three classrooms. Um, so district-wide, that's 15.6% of our students. The state really looks at K-12. So K-12 numbers is 13.6. Um, so it's that's a total of over 3,500 students that we're serving in Pajaro Valley Unified School District. And our numbers are going up. So then within that, we have 13 eligibility categories. I'm not gonna go through all of the categories, but I really wanted to point out a few things. And if you can notice, in 2005, we had 52 students that were identified as autistic. And now, in 2019, we have 220 students other health impaired, we had 97, and now we have 314. Wow. As emotionally disturbed students, we had 39, and now we have 130 students. Wow. This is a primary disability also, so if you looked at it up the numbers, it wouldn't match because there are also students that have secondary disabilities along with that. And so then how are we really looking at ed code and meeting these unique needs? And I have Heather Morin here, who's gonna speak to one of the programs that we're putting into place. And she's our lead behaviorist. Hi. So yeah, as you can see from these numbers, we really had to consider as a team, how do we support all these learners with autism spectrum disorders in our community and in our school district? And so with that, we were also given the gift of uh, lots of researchers looking at different studies and coming up with what are our 27 evidence-based practices that we know are effective for learners with autism. And with that information, we were able to partner with the California Autism Professional Training and Information Network, as well as the Diagnostic Center of Northern California, to develop and to implement evidence-based practices throughout our programs to support these learners in the least restrictive environment. So we're doing that with our NEST program, and then we also have a RISE program where we're working with students with emotional disturbances. Again, focusing on evidence-based practices and supporting the students to transition into mainstream classes with support and then hopefully out of the program. And you'll see more about that later. Um, so how are we helping all of these students? So I wanted you to see the personnel that's involved with this. We have 143 teachers. We have 72 supplementary service providers. That means speech and language pathologists, um, orthopedically impaired specialists, visually impaired specialists, occupational therapists. Um, under our paraprofessionals, we have 74 behavior technicians, and those are, um, are some of our uh, support staff in our RISE and our autism classrooms that have some more special training. We have instructional assistants, 222, and we have 19 school psychologists. So with all of this, we kind of wanted to look at wh what's happening with our money also. So as you can see, and I know it's hard to see, so I put the numbers a little bit bigger there, but back in 2011, the gray is what the federal and uh, state government is helping to fund, and this, the orange, is what we are contributing as a school district. So at that time, it was $10 million. As we go down to today, you see that the gray line has gotten smaller, and what we're contributing is more, and that's $33 million. Wow. So even with this increase of financial support and personnel support, we're still not quite moving the students like we wanna see, and I think that's where some of the concerns can come from. And we're looking at this of our um, dashboard data, 
and in ELA and in math, we're in the red. The state has just started looking at this in this way and looking for growth. And so hopefully we can see some of the things we're putting into practice showing that we're making this, this growth. But some of the things we're using to support this is really looking at multi-tiered systems of support. Um, we, and you voted on and ha have let us bring in adolescent solutions. We're um, supporting teachers with training them in rewards. We're supporting middle school teachers in SIPs so that they can catch the students and still teach them to read even at that level. Um, we're looking at our learning center models, our co-teaching in the high school. We're training all of our elementary special education teachers in SIPs too. And then we're restructuring our specialized academic instruction at the high school level, really focusing on areas of need in ELA and math. So this slide, we wanted to talk about the identification process and really focusing on, on child find and how the whole process works. But as you can see in my prior slide, I talked about our school psychologists. So those 19 school psychologists tested 600 um, uh, students for initial IEPs. And of those 600 students, 501 students qualified just last year. And I'm gonna have Heather step up again just to talk a little bit about the identification process. She's also a school psychologist. So when we're looking at uh, the referral process for special education, it's really important to also look at what's happening pre-referral. And why this is important is because we know that there are plenty of students throughout the district who present with varying needs in both academic and social and behavioral needs, and that we can provide them with a good intervention in the general education setting before looking at an IEP service, which requires specialized academic instruction, which is what the SAI stands for there in an effort to be able to serve them in that environment and to prevent over-identification of students with disabilities. Hi, my name is Michelle Shear. I'm the principal at Duncan Holbert Preschool. At Duncan Holbert, we support students birth to five. We have an early start program that services 40 students. In that program, they do in-home support. That's called an IFSP. It's an individual family service plan. And students can get those from birth and up to three. At Duncan Holbert last year, we received over 600 referrals that came through our door. Over 350 of them were San Andreas Regional Center. And under IDA, Individual Disability Education Act, we are obligated to assess all students with IFSPs. The other students came through Child Fine, so doctor referrals, parents, preschool programs, and at our school, we provide several services. We do full psychoeducational evaluations, we do speech assessments, and we also do SSTs. Last year, we saw an increase with those IFSPs with 41% increase in referrals. Um, Duncan Holbert has 13 classrooms. Five of those classrooms are inclusion programs. We've been very fortunate to have a partnership with Head Start, Migrant Seasonal Head Start, and State Preschool. In the last two years, we've increased three of those classes, and one of them is state preschool inclusion, and we also started the TK inclusion program. One is at Calabasas, and one is at Radcliffe. Two years ago, students transitioning out of Duncan Holbert Preschool, we had two students go into general education kindergarten. This year, we had 10 students go into general education preschool in kindergarten, and my team is really hoping that this year we'll have 18 students. Duncan's an unusual place, if you haven't been there. We have continuous enrollment, and that is due to our obligation under IDA. We assess students all year long. So for example, this year we're starting at 110 students, and we're projected to get to 220. We usually double enrollment, or we increase by 120%. So it's really important and imperative that we're really prepared for that type of growth. Last year, on average, we had um, six extra students every three weeks. So really, Duncan Holbert, um, some of those outreach programs is really the partnerships with our parents, building those foundational skills, having parent orientations. We do monthly trainings how to build that relationship to build those skill sets of the students. And we have a fluid program that we're always pushing our students to the least restrictive environment. Thank you, 
Michelle. So then looking at um, the state of improvement and what we're doing in special education, we're really looking at, like Michelle said, the preschool inclusive practices. We're looking at our core curriculum and how our special education teachers and students are accessing core and making sure that our teachers are getting the same training so that they can support te um, their students. We're looking at the adolescent solutions, SIPs and rewards, specialized intensive programs such as RISE and NEST and then co-teaching and learning centers um, training, and then really focus in on training for those where we're looking at um, before school started, and even last year, training just in preparation for some of these things, and then also hiring um, teachers on special assignments as coaches to go in and support teachers and staff. So we've also put together an exceptional education task force and the purpose of this is to look at issues within special education, come together and problem solve, basically. It's a problem solving group and then move forward with um, decisions that are made. It's general education and special education, both teachers, administrators on both sides coming together and it's um, being run this year by Casey Clappenbach. So we're excited about this task force. Um, our state requires that, um, I want to talk just a little bit about least restrictive environment. I started with this, but our state requires that we have 51.2% of our students in general education classes more than 80% of their day. Right now, the national average is 61% and PVUSD is at 50.68%. You can see that we're getting closer to what the state target is, but with the national target at 61%, I know that number is going to continue to increase. So we also have a target for having our students with the most severe disabilities um, out of their classrooms for more than 40% of their day. And so you wanna see that number that's in the blue actually going lower. So right now the state's asking that they're out 22.6% and currently PVUSD is at 25.2%. Again, we're getting close, but we're not quite there. So what does the research say about LRE? So the first quote, separate special education services had little to no positive effects for students, regardless of the intensity or type of their disability. Special needs students educated in regular classes do better academically and socially than comparable students in non-inclusive settings. Across a number of analysis of post-secondary school results, the message was the same. Those who spend more time in regular education experience better results after high school. So, our last slide is a little window into special education. I hope you enjoy this four minute video. You can't do not, you can't hear the talk? I just got here after you told me. Yeah, we'll let's try that again. Oh, it's just that one part. Okay. Let's start it all over again. Clean, nice. Good. I call it the red carpet gateway to the first experience of education to build that trusting partnership and bridge to really help their students have access and opportunities in the least restrictive environment. Oh, bye bye ice cream, nice job. One of the main things we really work on here in this class is what we call regulation. So that's just getting students comfortable in this environment, comfortable in an environment that's different from home, learning how to be flexible, learning how to follow directions, routines, procedures, learning how to share. Nice job, friend. Can you share with Nicholas? Nice sharing. 
So our goal is when students that come to Duncan Holbert to receive services for their IEP is to do early intervention, help them build those foundational skills and move them along the continuum into a general education setting or the least restrictive environment for that student. Oh, do you see mommy? And says, mm. oh, says, oh. At Rio Del Mar, we see autism as a gift. Our students with autism spectrum disorder are, are our students. They're in general ed classrooms for the majority of their day. I saw the creek and the two banana slugs. The NEST program, NEST actually is an acronym. It stands for the Natural Environment for Supported Transition. The program itself is designed around inclusion practices at the elementary level. These students associate themselves entirely as a student within that classroom. The general education teacher is their teacher, and we are the support staff to, to give them the social and academic support needed to transition on to junior high and high school. Um, the first time I ever wanted to camp ski skate. One of the big benefits of this for our entire campus is that we practice empathetic behaviors daily. Can you take a deep breath? We are more collaborative, we are more communicative, and we're definitely innovative. Where you do your distress scale for the morning and your sleep log, how much sleep you got last night and how you're feeling today. So the RISE program is a district program where students who have emotional disturbances and need intensive behavioral support, they come here. And we teach them social skills, social emotional learning and help them reintegrate back to the general ed setting. Yesterday we started talking about anger, identifying your anger, understanding your anger, where it comes from. So this is a self-contained classroom. However, when students hit a certain level of behavior, we do start to mainstream them. And the goal is that students are fully mainstreamed within one and a half years. Um, and many can, and some need longer. Does it give you an opportunity to stop and think and maybe take that break you need? or go to your friend, or just use the skills that you have to manage that emotion. Our idea is to use PBIS here intensively, integrate them into the mainstream setting where the gen ed teachers start to use those models as well. Ecstatic what? Ecstatic is very happy, like overly happy. Yeah. Excited, excited, excited. fearful. The more, the more trauma-informed a staff is, the more we can understand where students' behaviors come from, the more support and patience we'll give them so that they're successful outside of the school community. The, s the spirit of special education law is free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. Just from like the tone or like the way you seem in there, you can kind of tell. So what we're doing with the inclusion model for our mild to moderate students, our special day class students, is we created nine sections of co-teaching. So we're bringing the services to the student in their classroom. I want you to use these lists you just made to help you. When you have students be with their typical age peers, what you're seeing is higher academic achievement. You're seeing empathy from their peers. You have the teacher also being more aware of what students' needs are. You also have the ed specialist also working with other students who are not identified, who might have some language needs or social emotional needs, and we're there to help guide the teacher, help guide the student. The big goal is to get as many students with IEPs as diplomas. Thank you. And so that's our presentation and if there are questions. We have a couple speakers. First off, we have Laura Zucker. Hello. Hey, that was a great presentation. Good evening, everyone. It is exciting to see um, how we're getting kids together. I would say breaking down barriers to a certain extent and um, really honoring children's differences in general ed and in special ed. Um, the only thing I would say is that um, if we want to do this right, um, we need to listen to concerns of the folks who are in the classroom. Um, one thing I hear from teachers and other specialists is that, I won't say they feel that they're not heard because that's not a feeling. Um, 
that they are disappointed that they will make a suggestion and say for this child with his IEP, um, we're gonna need more support. Or this child at this moment has a lot going on and there are a lot of, perhaps there's behaviors that are going on that are disruptive or not safe. And frankly, we need more staff in the classroom, more behavior techs. And s often these teachers will say that they're not provided that support. And so I, I hope we can be, I hope that um, our leadership in SELPA can be flexible enough so that we can listen to teachers' concerns. They do know the teachers. They do know the children well. Um, I also hope that the teachers who are new, because we have quite a few new special ed teachers, because we do have, unfortunately, um, kind of an issue with re um, recruitment and uh, retention of teachers. I hope that they can be supported with actual, how can I say, with people coming into the classroom enough to see what the issues are. But mostly it's a question, as I spoke last year, of, of including teachers really in deciding how we implement something so it can be successful. They are there every single day, and I've heard concerns about um, implementation not always being successful because uh, teachers' viewpoints and their experiences are n might be listened to, but they may not be acted upon. And we want our children to be successful. We want to keep teachers, and actually giving teachers and other staff a voice will keep them. And I hope that part of implementing this great program will be listening to the general ed teachers and to the special ed teachers who are implementing it at their three pilot schools and making sure that we really try to honor their concerns and find solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Brandon Denise. Um, good evening. I want to thank the board for affording me the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, I want to make sure I preface my statements on saying that I have nothing but respect for most of you, and I think the rest of you need to get out of our way and stop making our job more difficult. Um, my name is Brandon Denise, and this is my fifth year in the district, four years as a life skills teacher, and this year as an RS specialist. I also have the honor of serving as a delegate on the CFT Committee for Special Education. I've seen firsthand the lack of support this district provides to their special ed teachers and their students. In my opinion, this report is nothing but hot air and lip service. This board should be ashamed for lying to your teachers, yourselves, this family, or families, and most importantly, these students. You can lie to yourselves all you want, but those of us in the classroom know firsthand how the structural deficiencies at SELPA make our jobs more difficult. You hire teachers without a credential who are either in a program or working towards a credential or have no teaching experience and you give them an entire school year to figure out if this is the job for them. I can't go to work as a doctor for a year without any experience, but say, you know what? Give me a year and then I'll figure out if this is a job for me and then I'll go to school. So why do you do that with teachers? Why do you hire teachers with no background, no experience, and then expect them to do the job of someone who needs experience in the background. What is the most disgraceful aspect of this, in my opinion, is you don't support these teachers. You place the obligation of writing a legally defensible and compliant IEP on somebody with no experience. And then you expect them to figure it out and give them little to no support. Furthermore, for these teachers, their first line of support is a PVFT member in their program specialist. Who you parade around as an admin and you give a program specialist as many as five programs to specialize in. How can they be a specialist in five different programs? Then, when these teachers get overwhelmed, you shift the burden of supporting these teachers from yourselves and onto other teachers? I just got an email today. Hey, we got two middle schools without an RS teacher. Do you want to write the IEPs for these kids? We'll give you peas and carrots. We're going to shift the burden away from supporting these teachers from us and on to you, on to other teachers. But hey, we'll pay you just a little bit to cover what you guys have as a deficiency. 
It's My idea is you stop lying to yourselves, your teachers, minutes, your families, your students. Stop shifting the burden of teacher support away from yourselves and on to teachers. Produce an actual report that shows us how many of these teachers don't have a credential. How many of these IEPs are not in compliance? The pr All I really want you guys to do is to support these teachers. Give us a fair shot. You guys are tying our hands by expecting us to pick up the slack for deficiencies that you create. Thank you. S Susan? Shotsky? I'm not sure. Good evening, board. I didn't know about this presentation tonight, but I'm happy that I was able to find out about it. And I thank you for your support in what you do do for special education. It is an important service, and I mind you that it is a service and a collaboration. We are one team, as Dr. Rodriguez um, has said in her mission statement. And it's really important that we do work together and that our students and teachers do receive proper you know, services and accommodations, and as Joe was saying, you know, the classrooms are really important and that it's communicated to us. We were promised a new redesigned special education classroom and it didn't happen and luckily we worked together with the superintendent and principal to have our special education students at Aptos High have an appropriate classroom that wasn't filled with mold and spider webs and just shoved in the corner. I'm still very concerned about this. And we are one team, so we do want to work together with parents and teachers and have our students access as much as possible so that we can be a community and partner with the school district and the mayor. So again, I can't um, encourage you enough to collaborate with the parents and the teachers and to have everybody included. That means that our special education teachers are at our Aptos High staff meetings. They're a part of the choir and the band or the sports facilities. We wanna see everybody as one team in the community. We put a lot of effort into Aptos High. For example, their football camaraderie. We wanna see everybody out included and at lunchtime see our children in special education not stuffed in their classrooms with their nurse have them be included out in the quad so that they aren't separated and hidden. And so we do appreciate your support, but we wanna make sure that they're getting out. So thank you for um, supporting these programs and then just make sure that we are, um, you know, making sure that all the staffing, I see Heather's spreadsheet with, you know, we have an OI and the numbers have gone down in OI. We have a new OI person and just making sure that the students are getting served and um, they're getting what they need because I know the district is putting monies into that. So we want to make sure that everybody's feeling supported and number one, the students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much for yours. Thank you too. Um, so is there any board comments? Hi, Heather, you want to step up? I just have a couple of comments. Okay. First of all, I'm, um, I'm impressed with what I'm seeing since you took over in your position. I do feel like there was a lot um, to repair and to improve upon, and I can see that, that it's happening. So I want to thank you for all your efforts and thank all you. the years that you've been here and building your team and everything. Um, I met recently with Regional Center because as you might or may not know, I'm a, I'm a clinical social worker and I work with, you know, lots and lots of kids in my practice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had Regional Center come and talk to all of my pediatricians at Dignity. Mm -hmm. And um, they are, they're sort of in a new place also where they have a little bit more funding and they want to collaborate more. So mm -hmm. they appreciate the relationship with Pajaro Valley, they would like to make that an even closer collaboration if possible. We just we just invited them to our next CAC meeting. So we are working towards building yeah. that collaboration, which we already have, but yeah. That's great. So I have a question about what I saw in terms of um, productivity on the psychologist side. Mm -hmm. So when I did the math, it looks like 
they're completing like essentially 3.1 assessments per month over a 10 month period. Mm -hmm. That does, I know they do triennials and uh, other yes, assessments yeah. and transition plans and stuff, but three assessments doesn't really feel like that much. So can you just talk, or maybe the psychologist can talk about what else the psychologists are doing? Yes. Yeah, so Cause you know, I'm held to a productivity standard and so I'd right. like to know that they're doing more than just three assessments a month. Yes. They are doing more than three assessments a month. Be and, and that's part of, they also have to do triennial assessments. So every three years, every student in our district is also given a full um, psychoeducational evaluation. So that's some of the things that they do. They also support staffs as a whole in working with students in general education and for behavior <coughs> intervention plans, working with principals. They can become part of the SST process. Um, they they can support and give information and ideas around 504 plans. So there are a lot of other pieces to their job that they're doing besides just assessing. They support in the classrooms with special education students. So there's more that is encompassed in their job okay. rather than just doing assessing. And I'm hoping that if we're looking at assessments and actually doing um, and having them do more support in general so that they can support students before they get to the assessment process. Um, and so, and then a follow-up question I have is just about staffing. I think we all wanna know that our mm -hmm. special ed staffing is um, higher than adequate, right? Because we know that it's hard to find teachers and oftentimes we start a school year um, without the required teachers mm -hmm. that we need that are well-trained, et cetera. Is there a plan with, uh, and I know Dr. Colleen has been working on um, a hiring plan for these hard to find and hard to fill positions, but right. can, I don't know if you can speak to it. Are we partnering with any graduate schools or credentialing programs across the state to try to find good staff? Yeah, we can, and um, Tony, if you'd like to jump in and just talk about some of it. I mean, because we are, we meet every other week with HR to talk about staffing and looking at our <coughs> issues and how we're supporting and building our staff. And so, um, I mean, if you can speak a little bit more to that too. Um, thank you, uh, Trustee DeSerpa. Um, SELPA is a very, uh, they have a lot of positions that are very difficult to fill. Um, and it is a challenge for us every year, and not just for our district, but this is a nationwide challenge uh, to fill those positions. Um, we have um, gotten better this year, but we are not, um, you know, we have not totally filled all the vacancies that we need to provide the adequate support. Um, some of the things that have worked, you know, to reduce those, the number of vacancies in, the, um, in, in those positions include early recruiting. Um, we recruit all year long. Um, we go to job fairs, you know, as early as January. Um, we have been um, working with colleges to reach out to student teachers. And um, you know, as was indicated earlier, we have um, worked to uh, do um, some of the you know variable waivers, credential waivers, to try and make sure that we can um, you know fill the the vacancies. But it does continue to be a challenge. Um, we're reaching um, out to uh, colleges um, more closely and working with them um, to with intern programs. And as you know, um, we did um, have a, a memorandum of understanding with PVFT um, for teachers that are within our district that we have um, that we're, we have a way of um, reimbursing them for their tuition costs um, to um, you know uh, to pursue uh, a special ed credential so we can uh, fill those positions with teachers that are already here and they have um, uh, an understanding of our culture and our uh, and they're already part of our family and so those are the best teachers to to recruit but um, you know and and those are some of the things that we're doing right now so that's like a pipeline though that won't be realized for a few years until the, if they're completed right right, right. Yeah, just just add on two other things. Um, one, we did negotiate a signing bonus for our hard to fill yes. position, so we do have that. Um, as well as kind of addressing another one of the concerns is um, having mentors for our our employees that are on internships and waivers. So most of the new teachers when they come in, they receive support from the new teacher project. But if they don't have an actual credential, then they don't receive that service. 
So we worked with PVFT now a little over a year ago in where our expert um, teachers, so our veteran teachers, um, become the mentors and supports for our teachers and they receive additional compensation for that so that we make sure and do that. I, I will say though, and I, I want to point this out, it's, it's a misnomer that um, our teachers with um, on internships and waivers are not good teachers. That, that is a misnomer. So that we have some of our brand new spanking teachers that are on waivers are actually doing incredible work for our kids. So I, I just want to make sure that we know, just like everything, we can't equate, um, we can't always equate one thing for another. Um, and we have seen a significant growth in those teachers um, in us retaining them. So they actually are receiving the coaching now, they're receiving the support, um, they have the heart for the kids and they want to be there. Um, I'm not saying that they're just like um, brand new teachers, which we release. Um, I'm not saying that we don't release any of them, but I just want us to know that um, we cannot equate just because someone is on an internship that they actually are not being successful with students because that's just not the case. I was just at two schools today and saw um, in each school, I saw a teacher that was on waiver and doing really incredible work for our kids. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. And we're also partnering, I mean, not only, we do have this partnership, but Jerry Pippen, who is one of our program directors, she's here someplace, is actually meeting and working with the New Teacher Project and getting training to become those coaches and making sure that we're providing the, the correct training, the correct support for our new teachers. And so that everybody that's starting, even if they're on a waiver, and they have that support. So we, we go over all of the lists and make sure that all of our teachers are getting support. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In the interest of time, I do have a lot of questions and some of them I will be able to go over um, with Dr. Rodriguez and get my um, answers and follow up with teachers and parents who have um, sent me questions that they want answered. But first, um, the task force, this is something new that we've created. Um, uh, tell me more about it. I know Casey is going to be heading this task force. Um, can you explain to the board and myself and people here a little bit more about the task force that's going to be happening? I can happening. start and then Casey you can jump in, but it's really a, a, to look at problem solving and to come together with the team of general education teachers, general education administrators, special education teachers, special education administrators, and to look at issues that are coming forward and to look at possible solutions so that we can implement those solutions and support our teachers. And you know, we want the input, we want to hear what is happening that we need to support and that we need to look at so that we can get together as a group and come up with some of the, uh, some ideas and how to support. Casey, do you want to say anything else? No, I think you basically summed it up, but we want to make sure that we're addressing some of the problems that were taken from the end of last year um, and that we are actually taking a problem all the way through to several different meetings and coming up with resolution and then tackling a next priority so we are coming up with some solutions to these, to these issues. So you're having teachers from each of these, the schools and the special programs on this task force as well? Yes. Um, my next question is, how much time does administration actually spend in visiting these classrooms? I don't think I've done a time study about it, but I know that the administration who are our program directors mm -hmm. and our, um, our um, program specialists who are not administration are out at school sites on a daily basis. I have been to three or four school sites within the last two days in, in classrooms actually observing some of the teachers that um, we've had. So we can look at it, but I know that that is one of the things that I put on as an expectation for the staff is that we're not just in meetings, but we're actually in the classrooms seeing what's happening. Um, I've been at Hyde and Soldo, um, you know, just a variety of programs um, across the district. So I also go up to the high schools and the middle schools too to observe in classrooms. Does the rest of your team also visit? 
Yes, they, okay. they do. And if you want to hear from them, they'd be happy to. <laughs> to. No, that, if, yeah. if they want to, that's fine. But yeah. I yeah. just. Two different sites today. Two different sites today. OK. So that's right there. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And do we have an audit procedure in place for IP, IEPs that they think are written incorrectly? We are looking at our IEPs and looking at how we're supporting our teachers in writing them correctly. So we have um, a group of teachers that we have asked to come forward. We're um, providing training to our school psychologists. I'm providing training to our program specialists and program directors so that we can try to before the um, IEPs are, got, you know, they have the meeting with the parents that they are looked at. Um, it's a process, it's in process, so we are, you know, working on this. And that's one of the things that the state's looking at, too, is that are we in compliance with our IEPs? Okay. So will the teachers who are involved in the LC model classrooms, are they going to be compensated for their extra work in writing IEPs and um, taking on extra responsibilities, um, sub plans, extra training, time? What's going to happen with these teachers that are providing all this extra help? So we, I, can, I can get back to you with some of that, but I know that the teachers are not being asked to write extra IEPs. Um, they are still having a caseload that is approximately the same. Um, the general education teachers, of course, would not be asked to write IEPs. Um, as always, they're part of the team, and they are invited to the IEP team meeting, um, which is a state mandate for general education teachers. Um, so we are working with scheduling and how to support the teachers throughout in this pilot site. And I know that we're, we're putting out sur um, surveys as we speak, actually, because Casey and I talked about it today, to ask, you know, what are some of the issues, what's coming up, so we get to hear from the teachers. Because we, like I said, we've been planning this for over a year just in the planning phase. We've been training since um, last year and looking at how to support. We have one TOSA um, teacher on special assignment just to support at the LC sites, and then we also have behaviors to support at the LC sites. So there's been a lot that we have put into um, supporting the teachers and then hopefully getting feedback from them so that we can come back, relook, and then move forward. So what's the plan for training IAs so that they're not impacting teachers in the, in the classroom? A lot of teachers are saying that it's impacting them because they're having to lose time, lose support because they're spending time training. I, I don't know if I quite understand that question, but we are training our um, instructional assistants in SIFs so that they can support the teachers. And we um, have had training time on Wednesdays that um, shouldn't be impactful because the IAs are also here on Wednesdays. I don't know, Jerry, if you wanted to, because I know you've been working very closely with this also. So I believe this is in questions of the IAs and LC classrooms, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we are, we did do some training before school began for IAs. Um, we currently do have several IAs on leave, so we have some subs in those positions to um, try to fill them, but we do have some um, contractual challenges there. Um, and then we, the also thing is, is we do have a monthly Wednesday plan to train the IAs, um, and that was put in place to actually start next week before school started. But the principals and the LC teachers and the teams at the end of last year wanted some time to get school started before we started in on a bunch of training. Um, I was in a class, kindergarten classroom, and I remembered that today was day 21 of school. And so I think some teachers at the end of last year and even the beginning of this year wanted time to get settled into their classrooms. And so we, when we did all of our training plans, they were all set up to start mid-September, which is next week. So those, those plans are in place to train those people. Okay. Thank you. I have more questions, but I will follow up with Dr. Rodriguez and I think maybe an, another presentation in a couple months with an update on a lot of these questions. And from the task force to see where we're at would be a good idea. Um, do we have an organizational chart? Do we have a chart on the website that shows you know, program director? Because yes. I looked yes. for it yeah. and I couldn't find it. Oh, OK. So yeah, um, it is on the SELPA website. And if it's not there, it might be buried. And I can get it so okay. it pops up more. But um, 
It says we have it's, three. It should be on the CELFA website. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I see that we have three program directors, Regina Bauer, Jerry Lippin, and Carrie LaRue. Or yes. What are they? Regina, Carrie, Jerry. I see that you guys are program directors on the website, but it doesn't say program directors of. Oh, so it's, yeah, on the organizational okay. chart, it, oh, sorry, it does show that, like, Kiri is working with all of our high school and alt ed. Mm -hmm. um, Regina is working with our middle school and deaf, hard of hearing, our DIS providers, speech and language pathologists, VI, mm -hmm. um, and then Jerry is working with all of our uh, elementary sites. Mm -hmm. and, and there's more, too, but that's yeah. in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> Who are Heather Waltz, Shannon McCord, and Heather Morin? What are the roles and are they teachers? Have you guys been teachers? So Heather Morin is here. <laughs> um, Heather Waltz is a behaviorist, BCBA, um, and she is not a teacher. And who was the other person? Shannon McCord yes. is a um, program specialist. And so we have our program specialists, some of them here too, um, Natalia and Leah, our program specialists. And they're they're not administrators, they're more like teachers on special assignments. Um, I was just, I know this has been uh, an issue for a while, as long as I've been here. I, I haven't been here yet, but I know it's been an issue with teachers. Um, after doing some research, I looked at the CELPA department in San Diego Unified School District, and they only have two directors. They have a director of instruction and school support, and they have one director of operations, ADA 504 and CELPA director. Mm -hmm. And what's, it, it just seems like we have a lot of, you know, managers, program directors, and I just yeah. wanted to put a face and name to these people and yeah. to see what's going on. So. Yeah, and it, if it's, if that's something that you would like me to research, every CELPA is um, organized a little bit different, yeah. and a lot of them are multi-CELPA districts, so I act as the CELPA director and the special education director in one, and then the support, so it could be, you know, I, I can look into it more if that's something you'd like about. I, I visited H.A. Hyde a couple times and I had a friend, he was a behavior tech that I, I, I know, and he told me that he, he stopped being a behavior tech at H.A. Hyde because he felt, as long as a lot of teachers didn't have a lot of help in the classroom, mm -hmm. and so I just, taking from what I heard and what I've been learning from the other trustees and from the teachers, and I just, want to bring up bring it up to light so thank you very much for your okay. question thank you for your answers I have a couple questions um, I'm really excited about the tax force I think that's something that is needed and I think hopefully it addresses many of the concerns that were brought up through our different speakers I think you know the more involvement we have of people actually doing the work in the classroom I think it's just gonna generate that momentum that we need, that buy-in from teachers, their feedback, um, and, and collaboration. Um, but I do have a couple questions for you. So um, I'm glad that you covered what you're doing right and the amazing work that we're doing as a district in certain areas. Mm -hmm. Could you expand on the areas of growth that you see moving forward? So I, I did also try to cover some of those in the PowerPoint. And I, and I saw like one or two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so really looking at our ELA and our math scores for special education, mm -hmm. that is a big area of what we're focusing on and how to support and change our practice with what we know about um, research that's coming up. So that's something that we're working on. We are always working on the fact that our IEPs have our in need of um, being in compliance. We've had a compliance review that you will hear more about in a future time, um, just looking at how we're doing. And there were some areas where we need to improve. And that's what we've started this year too with some of our trainings of looking at specifically, like making sure, and I mentioned the harmful effects statement, but mm -hmm. making sure that there's a conversation around that. That's something the state asked us to do and say, this is something that we need to be talking about and getting input from parents. So different things like that, we have a, a list of what the state is looking at for us to improve and we're starting to work on that within the district. Thank you. Regarding caseload, how mm -hmm. many AEPs are assigned to a teacher? 
it depends on their caseload, of course, but the RS teachers have uh, 28, um, and then there is also an MOU if the numbers do get higher, but they are not required to take over 28 students within their classes. Um, we have mild, moderate, and special day classes mm -hmm. that have a range in numbers. Um, some of our, like our deaf and hard of hearing classes may have lower numbers, whereas some of our mild, moderate, special day classes, especially at the middle school and high school level, may have higher numbers. Okay. And, and, and they can be between 14 and 20. Mm -hmm. And given that we're not in compliance with all of our IEPs, do you mm -hmm. think it would be a good thing to possibly explore the idea of an additional prep period specifically dedicated to reviewing IEPs? We can, we can bring that up in our task force. <laughs> um, and in regards to the referrals that we get from SARC, if mm -hmm. students do not qualify for services through Duncan Holbert, what other options do they have? So, so they don't qualify as a student with a disability? Right, so I've had a couple of uh, parents that have reached out to me that they had the initial referral from SARC, mm -hmm. then they went through our evaluation and they determined that they didn't qualify mm -hmm. for services through Duncan Holbert. Mm -hmm. And so then it would go back into general education and I don't know, Michelle, if you have mm -hmm. anything to speak to that with, you know, because then, the, then it does fall out of special education umbrella, but we are always trying to support mm -hmm. all of our parents and give them resources. Right, so what would be the options for those Well, parents? there's two different pathways. It's the full psychoeducational evaluation, which our preschool assessment clinic is part of that team that does those evaluations. In that process, we're always meeting with the families if they do not qualify. We actually have about a 90% qualifying rate and the really appropriate referrals that come to us of those other 10%, we do talk about their strengths and some of their challenges. We talk about recommendations. We're always um, encouraging to enroll in state preschool or migrant and seasonal head start. Um, we talk about PIP, um, mm -hmm. behavior intervention. So we really have a packet that we go through with our students. Okay. If they're doing speech assessments at this time, we do the speech intakes at Duncan and if um, they look like they need a full evaluation, those students go to the elementary site, the 16 sites, to do full speech and language assessments. Okay. Thank you. And they're provided services at the, and then they're provided services if they qualify at the school site, so it's their home school. Got it. Um, and then I'm really happy to hear that there are, we are visiting classrooms, um, but is there a follow-up to that, right? So if we do find that something's not working or yeah. that there's professional development needed. Right. Is there a quick follow-up to yes. what the needs of those teachers are? I can give an example. There was, um, I was at McQuitty t this week and uh, I was in a classroom where there was a behaviorist and really looking at how the behaviorist was used because they should be there as coaches and not stepping in as one-to-one -one if, if they can. So looking at that, talking with our lead behaviorist, um, Heather Moore in here, and then specifically she moved forward and did a training on how to coach in classrooms and looking at that. So those are the types of things when we see them, mm -hmm. we do get together weekly as a team and come up with plans of, okay, this is what we're seeing in the classrooms. These are the things that we can help support <coughs> and implement. And you know, it, everything takes time too. It's, mm -hmm. it's you have the training, you need to work on it and it's a big shift that we're moving, so right. it does take time. Okay, and um, who evaluates our teachers? So our teachers at the site level usually are um, evaluated by the site principal, mm -hmm. um, and then if the site principal in conjunction, so they don't feel comfortable going in and evaluating a speech and language pathologist that's there mm -hmm. at site, then we can co-evaluate or work together with the SELFA team to support. Okay, so that was that was my primary concern <laughs> what <laughs> I wanted you to get at. Yeah. Um, just because, um, you know, if we have a principal at a school site that doesn't have a special ed background, right. I'm not sure that they have the skill set needed to really evaluate a special ed teacher. Mm -hmm. So I think whenever possible and whenever we can, I think we should have someone who's an expert in the area be part of the evaluation process. Right. 
I think that would be beneficial to, to our teachers and Indian our students. Just a reminder, we went over a lot. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry? Went over that discussion a lot, but I thought it was an important issue. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to duplicate any of the, <laughs> the questions, but I was just curious um, regarding the increase in students with autism and other health issues. Is that due to an overall increase in these type of students, or is it because these students have previously received services elsewhere and are now returning to our district to? No, I, I think it's due to an overall increase and then. Uh, looking at the more that we gain knowledge in the field of autism and the spectrum disorder, that our understanding of it has increased. And would you add anything? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No. It's, it's, it's also because we had a lot of them going elsewhere and now they're here. They are coming back as much as they can to our district or we staying used to, in our district. Because so we used to have not. a lot of them, aren't they, aren't you, didn't we have a lot of them that went to Bay School and then we've been able to get them back? Is, yeah. Isn't we, that we true? Have, we still have some that are at Bay School. I know, but um, I'm just saying yeah. we but have more of them here and not as many there, though. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's true. Um, and I just you know, really want to ask, I mean, I guess this whole feeling of teachers of not being supported in their special education classes, um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, I don't know if there's enough coaches to go around to be at these special, you know, to be there for these special education teachers so they don't feel alone and they feel like they're more supportive. I'm, I'm just, you know, because you hear about all this stuff. Well, you know, even one man that got up, you know, we're not, we're totally not supported. You guys don't understand what we're doing. People don't, whatever. I don't know. So, <laughs> I'm just, you know, hoping that. Obviously, it's really important for the retention aspect of special education, obviously. The teachers feel like they're really supported in their classrooms and they're, you know, people are there for them and, they, and they're recognized for all the hard work they do. I don't know if you can have more kind of recognition kind of things in special education to recognize teachers doing I don't know. No, this, no, yeah, no, well, no. You said no. 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 <laughs> I don't know. This, this <laughs> Maybe last not. year we but did start a newsletter, <laughs> and every single edition of the newsletter we have um, spotlight on teachers, and so if that goes out to all of our staff, and it's on our website. So if you look through that, we do try to highlight and spotlight not just the teachers but the instructional assistants, and we have a lot of people that are doing really amazing things. So if you can, if you want to check that out, I know you get our newsletter, and um, you can look at that. I don't know if <laughs> I heard, I looked at somebody and said, no, that's not good. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so I'm just hoping there can be, you know, we can figure out, I mean, how, how often does the task force meet? We have a full schedule. Um, it's every. Can I address this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go right. ahead, go ahead, I so want you to. So we, we will be starting um, once a month, and if we need to meet more often, we will. But our goal this year is to really bridge and connect that gap between general education and special education services. And so as we're, we wanna make sure that we have that empathy and we come out and we will be, we're starting with the Learning Center sites with our partnership with um, PVFT. We'll, we will be meeting with those sites and those teachers to see their concerns and listen to them so we can problem solve together also. Um, and then I also want to just add to that piece where we do want to build that capacity with our site administrators um, in the general education population because our students are all general education students first. And we do want to make sure that we are building that capacity at our principal meetings. We will be, we're partnering um, with our special education services and we will be supporting our principals and being able to support the IEP process. And in regard to the um, action items, the corrective actions on IEPs, um, we have identified, we've been given um, patterns that we have missed, if you would say, with those IEPs, and they are being addressed with the special sessions with our special education teachers um, by our special services team, and that will be an ongoing process, so we will be training our teachers not to make those same mistakes. 
Okay. And I think with that partnership with general education, we will be um, able to write better IEPs for our students because we want them to actually reflect general education like the continuum of goals because our, our goal is to really get them working towards those standards in small increments. And so I think the partnership between general education and special education will actually help build all of our students up because if we support those teachers and get them the curriculum like SIPs, so that's what's been missing also is a clear curriculum for some of our special education teachers and making sure that they're included with the same trainings um, and I think we're, we're working towards those efforts. So, yes, so, so I was wondering, you know, somebody said concrete steps. So is there, is there a way that this task force can really reach out to the teachers and listen to what they have to say about, you know, their concerns or whatever? I mean, is there a way that you or people, whoever yeah. can get out there, you mm -hmm. know, more and more with the teachers that are working in special education to kind of just hear their concerns and so on. That will be our goal. Yes. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I still had questions. You never came to me before you started, so, um, and I'm not gonna let you off the hook, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, I, I just wanna agree with, you know, first with two of my colleagues, um, Trustee Dodge Jr., he made a very good point about um, the, seeing an org chart of your department mm -hmm. from you all the way down to even the classified yep. employee that's staffing and helping in the numbers of what that is. All the directors, whether you're a program director, or a psychologist, a behavior specialist, a certified teacher, mm -hmm. all the titles and how many. Um, and I do believe it needs to be easily accessible on the website. That kind of leads to um, what my colleague Trustee Shocker said. Um, I do think this needs to come back and not long term down the road, but maybe within a few months, because this topic um, was it was slated for 25 minutes. It started at 8.28, we were over an hour on it. So more than twice the amount of the slotted time has been spent on this topic. That's mm -hmm. telling me this needs to come back very soon in the near the future. Clearly, a lot of my colleagues and I are getting fielded with a lot of complaints about the SELPA mm -hmm. department that I think are trying to get addressed here tonight. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't <coughs> think they're all fully getting answered, so I think that that would be, again, having this back in a few months and getting some of these answered and seeing how this task force is working as part of that. Um, a few of the complaints that I have that were questions that I had for you tonight um, is why are we having people developing and implementing instructional programs for special needs students in the classroom who have never actually been teachers in a classroom? So are you speaking of, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you're speaking of, of if it's looking at, because we do have our teachers and like I'm behind, we had programs that are being implemented and put together from um, the diagnostic center. And so teachers are involved, behaviorists are involved. They're never done without a credential, credentialed teacher in that position to support. All of our program specialists are also credentialed teachers that are helping support this process. Credentialed teachers that have actually worked in a classroom? Yes. In different areas, yes. Okay, that, that's, that's counter to what, and there were some things that you responded to a couple of my colleagues earlier this evening that were also counter to, I think, the feedback that we're getting. So mm -hmm. there's some, and I'm not saying they're right and you're wrong or you're right and they're wrong, mm -hmm. but the truth lies somewhere in the middle and we need to get to what that truth is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to have, to me, the special needs students of our community are so important. Right. And having a staff that can facilitate those needs and that is also feeling supported facilitating those needs, that's crucial. Right. That's not secondary to me. Right. That's, that's really up there, along with general ed. Right. Um, and maybe even more so, because these are m some of the most vulnerable students people and our students district, in our yes. community. Yeah. The other concern and complaint that um, I've heard is that you're, uh, and so this is going back to the same thing, similar, is that some of the people that are evaluating these teachers are people who have never worked in a classroom themselves. And, and I could just say from a two, prong perspective, being mm -hmm. a business owner and also working in education myself. I would never have someone in my county 
evaluate someone in my sales department. Mm -hmm. And as someone who works in education and teaches, I would never expect to be evaluated by someone who has never spent a day in a classroom. Right. And so it, I just want to assure that that's yeah. not happening again. Maybe the truth somewhere in the middle, but mm -hmm. if this could come back to us in, okay. in a yeah, couple and, months. And our principals and our administrators, I mean, I was a teacher for 16 years in both special education, general education. We are the evaluators. The, the principals are the evaluators. So that's who is doing the evaluation process within our district. Exactly. And we would never have a principal who had never had a day in the classroom. So. Yeah, Again, and, and I'm they not, do have, yeah. I'm not on the front line of this, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know where the truth lies, but this is where mm -hmm. these, you know, part of our, our stakeholders in this community are teachers and the employees right. in your department. So when we're getting this many complaints, we have a duty and responsibility to those stakeholders to, to be asking these difficult questions. Right. right. And so this will be my last note on this because this is also something I observed earlier and I really hope this is not what happened, but I, I observed that one of the um, community guest speakers was escorted outside briefly. And I certainly hope that person was not escorted out of a public meeting because they came and spoke about things that were in contrast, disagreement to the district's administration or even this district bo governing board because that should never happen in a public meeting. I don't know that's what happened. I certainly hope that's not what happened, yeah. but it should never happen. Thank you. Okay, okay. we're, we're going to move on. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay, so is this Heather again for the staffing 11.6 consent agenda? They, they pulled 11.6 from our list. Oh. Can Chona answer it? I don't know. No. Oh, 11.6. Yes. Um, so, yes, I'm here to answer any questions about our speech and language pathologists that we're trying to hire to fill uh, a leave of absence. Well, I, I was just wondering about. something that I had noticed on the backup on this, um, or it actually there was no backup with this. That was what was concerning to me. And there was just a note in the um, agenda that was publicized that it says the, the master contract will be available in the special services office. Why was that not attached as backup on this topic it's when it's in consent agenda? I mean, because I'm taking it, it's in consent agenda because there's also money associated with it as well mm -hmm. as we're bringing someone on. So why was that master contract not attached in the backup with it? Yeah, so typically we do not. Um, if that's something that we need to do, we can definitely do that moving forward. We have always just in all the consent agenda items saying that those contracts are available. If that's something you'd like us to do, we can. Yeah, I just don't feel that this leads to um, transparent disclosure. Oh, yeah. And as a public entity, I think we always have to have that. We have an accountability and responsibility to mm -hmm. that. Um, so. If my colleagues would be willing to move it forward to the next meeting for approval, I'd be happy to look at it at that time. Otherwise, I will be voting no on it tonight for it not being there. I would like to make a motion that we put it can, on for next agenda. Can I address anything with that? Or um, yeah, there, there is implications for student services, for the students receiving the services. So we need to know that if we do not approve this, and that will mean that students will not receive services um, for over two weeks. And then we will owe. Well, then I think that, that, you know, that was on admin, I think, to have had that on the forefront. I, I am not confident and, or comfortable, excuse me, with voting on something that I just feel lacks transparency mm -hmm. when um, we have a responsibility as a public agency to be fully transparent. So well, I'm going to call for a motion. Well, I think you have a motion on the floor. Oh, you can we second it? I second her motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Aye. That was 
got very confusing. <laughs> I know. So there's what some of the I voted so, aye. So that was the vote to delay it. No, oh, no, no, no. So that's what the vote was to delay it. Oh, the vote the is delay it. Oh, okay, so I, I'm not voting aye. I'm mm -hmm. voting no. Karen, could you recall the vote for just yeah. the ayes and then call for the noes yeah. so we can have clarity yes. there, please? So um, how many are in favor of putting it on another agenda? Aye. 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 How, how many in, not in favor of doing that? No. 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 So there's, there's four to three. Okay. So now we need a motion. A motion to approve. So I'll make a motion to approve the contract for the speech and language pathologist. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Opposed? No. Opposed? No. Okay. Motion passes. Okay. Oh, so, so, t so there's five. one, two, so there's five, two. So we're back to 9.2, right? Now we're down to action items. No, I think we voted on that one. Oh, oh okay, okay. I thought we didn't move to vote. So we're going to approve resolution 1920.05 by adopting the school facility needs analysis and and update of level two development mitigation fees. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion passes 6-1. Now we're finally on 9.2, <laughs> sorry. Um, we're gonna go over the unaudited actuals for 2019-20 revised budget. And the report is by Joe Dominguez and Helen. All right, so good evening, uh, board president, members of the board, <coughs> cabinet, and members of the public. So this evening we're presenting 2018-19 unaudited actuals and uh, we'll go through the agenda is um, going to describe what our unaudited actuals uh, overview of our unaudited actuals and then look at our budget year summary from last year to this year and then uh, review the variance report our fiscal challenges uh, that we're facing as a district and then also discuss next step I'm gonna hand it off to Helen here So unaudited actuals are a summary and a comparison of our how we ended the year and um, the current fiscal year, um, the revision. Um, we were required by Ed Code to present this and have it presented before September 15th of each year. Uh, once it's been approved, uh, the it will go to the COE for review and also our independent auditors will come in and um, actually review the report plus backup. Um, do sampling on different uh, back, backup and everything to make sure we're in compliance with GASB and um, uh, other agencies. So comparing what we brought to you in June for estimated actuals to where we are, uh, where we ended the year, um, we were very close. We had our ending fund balance went up about $710,000 which is really um, amazing. It's less than 0.3%. Uh, yeah, 0.3%. Um, and um, I want to contribute the success of that to my team uh, for actually working close. Um, so this is where, again, where we ended in 1819 and also our revised for 1920. Um, and we are um, we are deficit spending, continuing to deficit spend, and um, so we want to um, kind of look at that. Yeah. And so the deficit spending that was um, 
for 1819, uh, you see that in, in brackets, is 12.9. Uh, our ending balance was 27 million, uh, a little bit over 27 million. And you r look at 1920 at the next column over, and you see the beginning balance of 27.06 uh, for 1920. And then you see the deficit uh, of 17 uh, million um, and the ending balance. So this is really what I want to focus on. So our ending balance for 1819 is 27.06. And if you look at 1920, it will be 10.06. Um, so a major decrease and our ending balance. Um, but I also like uh, commend the team um, and also commend site leadership, cabinet, um, and district leadership for working very hard to work within our budget um, and our allocations that we were provided. And so it was definitely a team effort. Uh, the total fund balance, as you see, uh, we have our 3% reserve for both 1819 and 1920. So uh, maintaining uh, fiscal solvency, and that's the one major thing that the county and the state look at, is making sure that we meet our 3% reserve and then have cash flow. Our assigned fund balance that you see at 3.91, that was for Pajaro Valley High School, the football field project. And you see that for 1819, and you've seen that in previous years. What you see now for 1920, that is gone. And the reason is, is that is being used now for the project to be completed early next year. Another highlight that I want to stress is uh, in the current year, for 1819, we have an additional 3% reserve uh, that the board approved uh, at 6.83. And if you look at 1920, we have to use our additional 3% reserve. Um, and we'll explain why, and there's many factors uh, that contribute to that. Uh, declining enrollment and other cost uh, increases. And then you look at the committed fund balance uh, that was board approved, and you also see that being reduced in 1920. And, and so I just really want to highlight that. One of the things that I touched on in that is the fund balance. So you see that for the current year, um, and I'd really like to highlight for 2016, you see that at over 20%, um, and under uh, the new administration, new leadership, we stress the importance of using current funding uh, from the state and investing those dollars on our current <coughs> students. And that reflects that we're using that funding, uh, we're maximizing that fu that funding and investing it at on students. So you actually see the decline of the uh, fund balance uh, in 16, 2017, 2018. It's down to 17 percent. Uh, we are projecting, as we mentioned previously, 18, 19. That is going to be approximately 10 percent. And then for 19, 20 we're projecting that's going to go down to 3.8% approximately. As we mentioned previously, this is the uh, cleanest uh, budget uh, as far as unaudited actuals and the variance, and commend the team. Um, this it came in at 0.27% um, of our unaudited compared to estimated actuals. So what we budgeted uh, and our actuals reflect less than 0.27 uh, variance. So uh, that is uh, teamwork at its best and commend everyone in doing so. Um, the revenues uh, reflect a uh, decrease in LCFF and that's based on the FICMAT calculator and previous in our first and second interim budgets as we know um, LCFF was fully implemented under our new governor and so that reflects that. An increase that we mentioned in STRS and PERS and uh, adjusted on behalf with the expense offset. And so you have that reflective. And then grants are adjusted based on the grants received and actual spending of those grants. And so that's also a reflective. Um, general fund expenses uh, vary, um, but uh, from salary and benefits, books and supplies, services and operating expenses, and capital outlay. Um, one of the items that we are looking into right now is we saw an increase in classified extra work agreements uh, came in higher than projected. Uh, so we're looking into that. We're not sure if it's due to absenteeism. Um, is it extra assignments? Is it what was the uh, condition that caused that? So we're looking at that. 
We were aware um, through the governor's office and the state regarding stirs and purrs, um, but that was after the fact, but we made the adjustments accordingly. And then one, uh, I'd like to commend um, our new um, workers' comp risk and safety manager, uh, Ruth Gonzalez. She has uh, taken the leadership, and we, I'm pleased to say we have a reduction in our workers' comp claims, uh, and we're continuing down that path. Um, books and supplies, um, there was a decrease according to uh, the services provided. And then uh, increase of grants uh, were spent on services uh, rather than supplies, so we made those adjustments. On capital outlay, we have uh, a decrease in the energy projects because uh, in process and completion for 1920, and we're underway right now. And one of the things we've done too to manage costs is we've built internal capacity, so we're actually we have our internal maintenance team handling the energy projects ourselves. And then the increase of deferred maintenance projects uh, have been completed, and we're actually repairing a lot of uh, major items throughout our district that range from plumbing to gas, et cetera, HVAC. Uh, fiscal challenges as a district, uh, as of today, we uh, projected in our assumptions, we projected 180 uh, decline uh, enrollment, and as of today, we're at 340 students decline. So that is uh, higher than what we uh, anticipated. Um, the number uh, that we will change on a daily basis, uh, we think a dozen or so from yesterday to today, um, we have till October 2nd uh, this year for our census day, and that's the day that we report to the state what our enrollment is as of that date. Uh, so we will uh, provide updates accordingly. Um, another challenge is the independent charter uh, school enrollment growth. Those are charters that are not uh, dependent charters and not authorized by the district under our uh, preview. Uh, contribution from unrestricted to restricted, increase to health and welfare benefits, uh, PERS and STRS. I mentioned the deficit spending, and then the reduction of our 3% additional reserve for 1920, and then, as I mentioned, the reduction of our ending fund balance. So for enrollment trends, you see the decline um, um, in the out years. And another point that I like to stress is that our unduplicated count of the students that we serve, so English language learners, uh, free reduced lunch, in, um, et cetera, is approximately 80% as a district. So that's who we serve. And then the English language learner, we're approximately about 40% of our student population, uh, give or take. But overall, our enrollment is declining. Uh, and we're looking at those various issues of why we are declining. One of the other uh, major concerns that we have is the required contributions from unrestricted. So uh, the funds that we receive that are unrestricted and transferring those funds to restricted accounts. And we have um, some departments that we have to as a district uh, because the state or federal government does not provide adequate funding to fully uh, run the program and implement the services that we need to. Uh, with that being said, SELPA for 18-19 is 27.1 million, and for 19-20 we uh, have a, a contribution of 29.7, and then routine restricted maintenance, uh, approximately 3%, uh, it's equal or greater to 3% of our general fund uh, for maintenance, uh, custodial, and grounds. Um, and that was something that was implemented uh, just recently under Governor Newsom. And so that's at 7.1 for 18-19, and then for 19-20, it's 8.3. And then other mi miscellaneous contributions um, is Diamond Tech, and then our early childhood education, uh, which is a total for 18-19, 1.1, and 19-20, 1.5 million. Our, one of the other areas that we look at is um, how we use our funding and maximize our resources. And this one is commendable to our district to show that we are making things happen, investing our dollars at our sites on students and comparing um, PVUSD to other districts for general administration costs. We are the second lowest uh, in the region and we are at 4.29%. So I'd also like to commend our leadership, um, our staff, and those dedicated uh, for students first.
and it reflects in this graph. Next steps is a continued meeting with our, our school site and department heads, um, having our quarterly budget uh, meetings and review, and making sure that and uh, for 1920 and our actuals and uh, continue with that in the next 45 days. Um, the other piece is um, implementing best practices. What we noticed last year is definitely including procurement and purchasing in the quarterly uh, review. Um, one of the internal efficiencies that we're trying to handle is we have funding available for school supplies, uh, materials, et cetera, and just making sure that we spend that throughout the year instead of at the end of the fiscal year when we get bombarded with a lot of orders um, and we're just trying to spend or order everything uh, in the last couple of months. And we, so we want to make sure we spread that out throughout the year and you, we use it on current students. And so we're doing that. Um, once again, enhanced internal efficiencies, our enrollment uh, is a concern. So making sure that we uh, get an assessment and uh, work on those numbers. And then definitely all in every day um, is our average daily attendance. So uh, focusing on our ADA in partnership uh, with union leadership uh, and our teachers, classified staff, and throughout the district um, and making sure that we can increase our average daily attendance, our Saturday Academy. And then finally, as we mentioned, um, our SELPA services and with the leadership that we have is working to enhance the services between our student programs and internal efficiencies and how we can maximize services for our students. So our recommendation is to approve uh, a very low variance uh, report for our 1819 unaudited actuals. Thank you. Any public speaking this morning? No. Okay. <coughs> Any discussion from the board? Yeah, Jennifer. Because um, you had a, a separate discussion about we had the declining enrollment and we also talked about an increase in the um, independent charter school um, enrollment. So does that, are they two separate things or is that a factor on what our declining enrollment is? So unfortunately, um, we have both. So we have um, increasing number of students that are going to independent charter. And with the current numbers, we have approximately 150 additional students, which did not show up um, these first few weeks of school. That did not go, when we look at the numbers of the charters, did not go to charters, but um, it looks like actually went out of state or at least went out of the area. Yeah, before, you know, her, her um, declining enrollment was just the charter school. That's how we looked at it before, right? It was just the, of course, the navigator. There was about 180 students that were going, that are going there. Correct. And so that's how we looked at our declining enrollment, but now we figured out it was a lot higher than that. Right. That's how we did it, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, birth rate went down, so we knew that. Um, I, what we thought was gonna happen, so we actually budgeted for 191, I believe, is the decline. Um, and then we, we believe that the new buildings that were coming in, the new um, housing that was coming in was gonna help with some of the declining enrollment that we've been experiencing because of the low birth rate. Um, it did not come to fruition in that we had significant amount of students that did not come. Um, we know that because we checked enrollment of our other charter schools, including our own, but um, they did not go up significantly. Um, and it's a true smattering across the board. Um, so it's not one particular grade level and it's not one particular school in which we lost students. Is it, do we have some issues with um, the border being so hard to get across now that we're losing families that normally would come across to work? Probably. I mean, I, I can't really hypothesize when we, w of the students that we know that are leaving, when we ask them and where the cumes are going, is they're going out of state. So they are going to cheaper to live yeah. um, places. So they're going to Texas, Utah, Arizona, um, they're going to other states that are just cheaper to live. Yeah, the rent is very, very expensive. 
So congratulations. Can I go next? Sorry, I should ask you this. Can I talk now? Oh, yeah, you, you, you've already been talking. Go I ahead. know, but <laughs> I just asked permission. Okay. <laughs> so um, that's an amazing variance. It's probably, I mean, not variance, but um, what's it called? Yeah, variance. The variance. Yeah. The point two seven. I mean, that's the lowest I've ever heard of anywhere. Yeah. Not just for us, but like anywhere, it's right? Yeah. It's shocking. <laughs> so partly, congratulations, because we want to be very transparent about our budget so that um, PBFT and CSEA really understand what our numbers are and what we have to work with. So I think that's good. What makes me very, very nervous is that we're cutting very close to the bone on the budget. And I was a sitting president when the state pulled back millions of dollars and then we were in big, big trouble and had to make immediate cuts to multiple areas of our budget. So I, I am concerned that we don't really have anywhere to go um, and in no, pr no real projected revenues. One of the things that I learned le on Monday um, working with the other county um, trustees is that um, CSBA is really focusing on um, advocacy in the special education area so that uh, because it, for almost everybody the special ed dollars sort of um, bleed into the general fund there's not enough money to run the programs and so that is an area that I think statewide everybody's going to be focusing on trying to get Governor Newsom to release dollar more dollars for special ed so I, I'm hopeful those will come <laughs> yeah, we're, we're definitely keeping an eye. That's approximately about $2 million uh, for PVUSD. Uh, but there is definitely a statewide effort uh, to focus on uh, special ed costs and also funding. Uh, so we are looking at that. And have you, what else have you heard in terms of themes um, for um, education advocacy? Another from uh, the state? major component, uh, Governor Brown to Governor Newsom, uh, the full day K uh, funding uh, for districts in California. It was open to all districts, even if they already had full day K, to expand their full day K. And Governor Newsom shifted that to saying it has to be for districts that do not have full day K to start a full day K. Um, the funding has been reduced, but that shift has actually given districts like PVUSD an opportunity now to a stronger chance to get those funds. And are those grant funds that we need to apply for? It, or yes, yeah. and, and we have applied for them. Okay. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so that's another opportunity. Um, and the other piece that they're looking at is as we or, or CSBA has put out um, is uh, more regulations around uh, independent charters and the startup and oversight and so they're shifting that to the or potentially shifting that from the state level to the county level and so that's something that's also being considered. Thank you. You're welcome. And so I, I just you know <laughs> I'm just kind of hoping because you know we've gotten all these awards and stuff like that, we can get you know huge amount of money from I don't know Google or Hewlett Packard. I mean, you know, some big corporate corporate money that you know I'm saying because we are a district that's been awarded now, you know, with some stuff, and, and she's got lots of awards too herself, Michelle. <laughs> um, that we can, you know, that's what my hope is that now we can be awarded by, you know, some big, you know, fund from some huge, you know, corporate fund. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> is, I mean, is is there a possibility for that, Michelle? <laughs> Looking at this? well, um, so grant funding and foundation funding is always excellent, um, especially for programmatic needs. I, so yes, that would be great. I mean, one thing that came with some of the designations that I got from in a past district is we wound up receiving a lot of uh, foundational funding. Um, and those are a good thing for programmatic needs. I think one thing that we need, which is why the CSBA work is so important, is we need ongoing funding that doesn't stop. Yeah, that's right? true. Um, so the, found, the foundational funding is important because it can help um, support projects that we want to implement. Um, you know, and we did bring in $6.9 million worth of grant funding this year, so that's a good thing, and that helps us pay for things that we wouldn't be able to pay for without it. 
Um, but what we need from the state is we need ongoing funding that doesn't go away. No, 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 that's um, true. Because if we're going to be using it for staff costs or for increased costs like PERS and STRS benefits, then it can't ever go away. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say yes to both. We want yes to both. <laughs> um, and as we continue to get accolades, we will continue to turn heads just like on Monday. Um, the Pebble Beach Foundation reached out to me during an event I was at um, and said, we want to work with you and, and help fund some of your work. Um, and so that's why they're gonna be at the Save the Music um, lunch event. Um, so yes, I think um, we want both. Exactly. I mean, I mean the other one, statewide, we just have to continue to push for that, obviously, in, in a lot of different ways, yeah. <coughs> any, any more comments? Um, have we looked at, or uh, are we in the process of looking at either how we can cut back costs or stretch our dollars without impacting the educational experience and <laughs> no one's salary? Well, we've talked about So, that yes, we are looking at internal efficiencies. Um, one thing that we have accomplished, uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, one of the things that we have done recently is we de developed a job description and hired uh, um, a white fleet drivers. And that the counter of that is to reduce our special ed uh, taxi or other transportation. Uh, so that is in being implemented. Uh, so we'll probably have a report in a later point in time to see the impact of that. Um, and we're also looking at other uh, internal efficiencies as well. So I think I would like um, that item specifically to come back to the board at a future uh, meeting. Yeah, we will. Because I think it will be good for the board and the larger community to know, you know, where we're headed. Um, and then, uh, men Michelle, you had mentioned at the last meeting that we do get ADA funding from Duncan Holbert preschool program. Yeah, so it's actually incorrect on that. We only okay. receive, um, we receive numbers by the number of students we serve, but they only have to reach a certain threshold of days in order to receive that, in order to receive that money. So that we don't have a true ADA on there. Um, they do have to reach a, a certain threshold of days, a percentage of, in program mm -hmm. in order to be able to reach it, but we do not. Um, we do for Renaissance, um, and we do for all of our TK through through um, 12th grade students, but we do not um, for Duncan or any pre-K program. No pre-K. They have to be they have to be five um, by December 5th. Okay. Well, Two-minute right. discussion. And um, the fund that we do receive funding for them, but it goes to the specific programs. It's doesn't. It's not in the general fund. Yeah. Okay. Well, there goes my suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all right. <laughs> we will take all ideas. Then. Um, um, thank you, Joe. You're welcome. And next steps, if board approved, uh, we will uh, continue with fiscal transparency and we'll meet with union leadership. Um, so I'd like to commend Nellie. Uh, for reaching out, so we will schedule a meeting for next week, and then with CSCA uh, as well. So I just wanted to share that. Okay, we need to vote on this. I would so like I to move approval to I elect a motion to approve the 1890 not audit actuals with 2019-20 revised budget. Second. Oh, I'll second. But um, we're missing um, Trustee Holm. No, that's okay. Oh, she's leaving. Okay. I thought maybe she was. Well, she's going to the bathroom. So maybe that's what I thought. <laughs> okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay. So there's one, two, three, four, four to two. Four to one. <clears throat> okay. Let's move along. We don't have much time. 9.3 New Class Description Director of Facilities and Construction. Yes, thank you, President Osmondson, Board Trustees Dr. Rodriguez. My colleague Joe Dominguez asked me to introduce this action item, so I will do so for him. 
uh, an internal assessment of the maintenance operations and facilities department was conducted and in order to better serve the district, the separation of the maintenance operation facilities department into two departments, first the um, maintenance and operations and the second department would be facilities and, and construction is recommended necessitating a director to head each department. Uh, CBO Joe Dominguez will explain funding for the two positions and answer questions regarding necessity and essential duties. The first of the positions is a director of facilities and construction, which is a new class description and with the main duties as oversight of bond program, facility construction, renovation and repair of projects, as well as supervision, support, training and evaluation of assigned personnel. And take it away, Mr. Dominguez. Well, thank you, Chona, for the wonderful introduction there. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Pam Shanks, our Director of Classified Personnel, for uh, working with me uh, to develop and uh, have these items for this evening. So the Director of Facilities um, Planning and Bond Development, um, back in 2010, the, for those that were, were here, is the organization chart that we're following. Uh, we had two different directors overseeing uh, facilities and planning and bond development, and one overseeing custodial maintenance um, and grounds. For this position, for the facilities and planning, this will be 90% bond funded and 10% general fund. Uh, the reason it's not 100% bond funded is a, uh, legally or uh, as a district we can't supplant and this position would also cover small items that are general overall as a district and one of those items would be developer fees. So once they have oversight of developer fees, that's a district function, not a bond funded so that's why I have the 10% because they can assist me in oversight of the developer fees and other similar type projects. Um, but overall, this is, um, we're projecting the cost savings uh, with this position. Um, it would reduce uh, our program management uh, costs that we currently have consultants and other uh, costs incurred. And that ranges from 135,000 to 175,000 of annual savings. Um, so that would build internal capacity and we could do it ourselves. And then it would also assist in reducing construction management uh, costs. So we also have some consultants as well assisting in that. And so we're able to reduce that. Um, and that ranges from 125,000 to 250. Um, one of the items- Of savings. Of savings. Yeah. Um, internal efficiencies. Um, one of the challenges that we have currently right now uh, is our Department of State Architects, our uh, project closeouts. So DSA, in order, um, uh, a great example that's on right now, what we had to do was Aptos High School. There, uh, in order to even move forward with the roofing projects or the student quad, we had to close out a project that was done like 10, 15, 20 years ago. And for one reason or another, it wasn't closed out. And the state keeps very thorough records uh, of what was completed or not completed. And so even our architects couldn't even move forward until we had that project that was done 15, 20 years ago closed out. So this position would actually assist me in making sure that we close out all our projects uh, as we move forward and we still have uh, approximately 25 or so that are still on the books. Um, and, and then overall is making sure that we have a bond program master schedule and that's an internal uh, efficiency that we need to focus on and what does that mean? It means that for this year, how many projects are we having set up within our bond and the sequence and the timeline? What is spring break, summer break, winter break, and then the out year? And so the multi-year projection of that. And so with that being said, this is how this pot uh, position can assist and move the department forward. Okay, no public speakers. No. Okay. I okay. have a comment. Any discussion from the board? Yeah. Yes, I have a comment. Um, I just wanted to comment. Um, thank you, Joe, for your presentation on it and your looking into this and the revision of it. Um, both of these cost descriptions, um, probably long before even any of my colleagues were on this board, I remember back when this used to be two positions. And I know we had a lot of input also from the folks that work in the classified personnel in that department, you know, wanting to see this as two positions that it would help clean up things down there. Um, plus the cost savings, that's great. Um, so if none of my colleagues have anything further to add, I'll, I'd be more than happy to make a motion to um, move to approve this. Okay, is there any more discussion from the board? No, okay. Yes, okay. <laughs> 
So you know how hard I worked campaigning the bond in 2012. Mm -hmm. So I thought there was a provision in there that we couldn't use any bond money for personnel. So this is surprising to me that we would be using bond money for personnel. So can you explain what's going on here? So the, the language as in the bond language uh, is uh, district administration and the intent of that language. And so I checked in with our bond council um, and mm -hmm. confirmed. And what led me down the path was we're currently spending money on consultants um, that are doing the similar work that we can do ourselves for more than half of, or more than half of the savings on that or expense. Uh, so I checked in with bond council and the intent was uh, district administration, but for program staff and program management of the bond program, it's allowable. Okay, that makes me feel better. And because um, we're already contracting out, yeah. um, so it's making sure that there's oversight um, and as we uh, move forward to assist in a new bond as well, so that's the other piece. Um, yeah, I had a follow-up question. Some of the consultants we use, ho though, have very, very specialized expertise in areas that are needed to get things through DSA and get things up to the office of whatever, whatever, so we could get Prop 51 match, all that stuff. So are you telling me that none of those consultants will be used anymore? Because I'm worried that the person that we choose for this position won't have any of that expertise or contacts or, or staff to support getting those projects um, where we need to, to get them? No, uh, we will still use the specialty consultants. So um, soil sampling, asbestos, lead, um, some engineers, et cetera. The specific, if you look at the um, cover page, is specific to program management um, costs and construction management costs. So is making sure that we're contracting out the management scope of that currently is making sure that we bring that in internally. Um, and then the specialty consultants will continue to use, but it's specific uh, to a certain construction project, um, and it's very detailed. And we bring those uh, to the board. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Any other comments? I see none. <laughs> All those in favor? No, we had a second. We did it. I think second. You didn't second? Oh, I thought you said no. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Aye. Oh, okay, so there's four, right? Four, two, four, two, one. Four, two, one. Okay. Okay, move on to the next one. We gotta hurry up. <laughs> hurry up. Um, So specific to this position of uh, director maintenance, as I mentioned in operations, it's custodial uh, grounds in our maintenance department. And then this position is general fund funded as uh, the previous uh, position in 2010. However, this will be 50% uh, unrestricted and 50% uh, routine restricted uh, maintenance. Um, because as you recall, the state is now requiring us to fund at 3% of our general fund of our routine restrictive maintenance. So we're able to quantify 50% of this salary because it's overseeing the maintenance department and custodial. So we're able to split that 50-50. Um, so that assists with that effort to meet, meet that requirement. Um, how this position can help us save or enhance internal efficiencies, um, I would have to first and foremost, one of our areas of, uh, to enhance internal efficiency is our work order system. Uh, we have heard loud and clear from our sites, um, our staff and our site leadership of the turnaround time. Um, and so this position would focus, primary focus would be our work order system and making sure that we have a reduced uh, turnaround time, um, 90 days plus, uh, and try, the goal is for 30 days. Um, the other piece is uh, the fiscal side is, as we mentioned, uh, the extra work agreements, uh, overtime and comp time is making sure we have a reduction. Uh, realistically, we're looking at a 30% reduction there, which would be $153,000 savings. Um, so working as a team to reduce that. 
by 30%. Um, another area in partnership with our risk and safety manager, uh, if we can reduce our uh, workers' comp injuries by 20%, that's a $21,000 annual savings. Um, and then the scope or other added duties would be assist in developing a sub pool for our custodians. So when custodians are out sick, um, there's no coverage. And so making sure that we have a, a qualified sub pool and then overall assist in our annual summer uh, deferred maintenance projects. So if you know as our bond program is bond projects, bond funded, our summer deferred maintenance projects are the, or some are day to day, but the other ones are items uh, where it's plumbing, gas, water, et cetera, the major uh, projects from maintenance that need to be handled over the summer. And so overall it's a, um, a savings for the district and it provides more oversight of the budget and the department and it uh, supports the separation um, and the director of facilities. Okay, any comments from the board? Okay. So this is also coming from the general fund too? So yes, this one is general fund, it's unrestricted and then routine restricted maintenance. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, um, do I have a motion? I'd make a motion to approve uh, the revised class description for the director of maintenance and ops. Second. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the resolution. This is kind of an exciting one. Um, 192008 or VW Mitigation Trust authorization to apply to the big grant for our clean buses. Good evening, President Osmondson, Superintendent, Board of Trustees and Cabinet. Um, I am looking for approval on this resolution to participate in the Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Trust Program, which is going to allot $130 million to um, heavy duty sector, which is including school buses. And the approved plan ensures that at least 50% of this funding will be benefiting low income or disadvantaged communities. So I would like to see us be able to participate in this grant. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, any public speakers? No. Um, so let's have a motion. I make a motion to approve. Okay, okay all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, this one is five, I mean six. Six zero. One. Before you step down, so, that, so that if we got this grant, what would it mean? It would mean that we would, um, so it's a scrap and replace, so all of, uh, it would replace internal combustion engine buses, so we would have to scrap them and take them off the road forever, um, and the money would get us electric buses. And how many could we get, potentially? It's a first come, first serve. Um, I don't know the number, potentially. Um, yeah. Hopefully, a handful. We've already been awarded eight through the CEC grant, and um, potentially one more through the Monterey Air Resource board. And what's our fleet now? How many buses do we have? 96. You have 96, okay. Yeah. All right, so we can have the grant <coughs> in day one? As soon as they open it up and tell us how to apply, the only thing they've told us is that we need this resolution as a component of the application. Okay, you got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have motion first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I think we voted already. Aye. I no, did. I voted. <laughs> Okay, and I'm, I'm gonna have to extend the meeting, unfortunately, yeah. it's a bummer. So um, we're gonna try to extend the meeting. Can we do it just until 11? I would say 11.30 just to be safe. Okay, 11.30 just to be safe. Uh, hopefully 11, but 11.30 to be safe. All those in favor? Uh, do we have a motion? I don't think we have a motion or a second. I'll make a motion to extend the meeting to 11.30. Second. So All those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Did you ask for those opposed? Are those opposed? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay, 9.6, resolution for Latino Heritage Month. This is resolution 192007 for Latino Heritage Month. Good evening, President Osmondson, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. 
Hispanic Heritage Month takes place from September 15th to October 15th and exists to recognize and celebrate the many contributions, diverse cultures, and extensive histories of the American Latinx community. The Ethnic Studies class and other classroom opportunities throughout the district provides a safe space for all students to explore racial and cultural experiences and differences. This opportunity for students is important and very relevant today with the shift in the national narrative on race and justice. Within the educational opportunities throughout our district, PVUSD students study the social struggles and knowledge about Latinx population, and by doing so, we help empower the future by becoming aware of those struggles that exist in the social and academic worlds and encourage students to affect change. We also encourage PVUSD students to enrich our community by becoming involved as productive members who help to create a better and more peaceful world. It is only through the understanding and acceptance of one's own history that we can start to understand others. This is more important today than ever before. In front of you is resolution 1920-07 for approval that acknowledges PBOSD takes pride in joining citizens throughout the country in celebrating and acknowledging National Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you. <laughs> this is great what you said. Okay, Are any public speaker obviously. Okay, any comments from the board? No, there's not. <coughs> okay, do you have a motion to approve? Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, this is six, 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 six or one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for staff. helping us understand all that. And 9.7, it's an MOU with Monterey County Office of Education, U.S. Constitution Project. There you go. Yes, yeah, so th thank you very much. So um, about now a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, um, Karen to came to me because she had um, found that there was the possibility of our students within Monterey County, our middle school students within Monterey County to be able to go to the Hamilton play for free. Um, so we, um, we weren't originally able to have our students go because it was already impacted, but um, we did um, place the students on the wait list. They got in there. Um, so what this would provide the students is it would provide the curriculum for the teachers to use, um, and it would allow, it would, it would pay for the transportation and the tickets for our students to be able to see um, Hamilton. And so we're really excited about this collaboration, unfortunately, because it is through Monterey County. They would not allow us <laughs> to do any of our middle schools that are not in Monterey County. So only PMS is able to um, appreciate the experience, but at least we were able to do so um, for our students. So I'm requesting that um, the board approve the MOU so that our students can go um, and attend um, the ha C. Hamilton on October 23rd. And they're also going to, you know, learn a lot of stuff. They can do, put it in the curriculum and, you know, yeah, our teachers, get our teachers will be attending the training or attended the training on September 3rd. Pretty cool. Yep. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? I have a comment. Okay. So this um, project was made possible through a grant and I, do you remember where the money came from for this, Michelle? It was some benefactor in Monterey County. Yes, I worked, we worked directly with the CUE, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure I had that information. We worked with them in order to be able to just get this MOU going. Yeah, so not only do the kids get to go see a play, which is so life-changing in and of itself, the teachers get curriculum about yes. how to teach on the U.S. Constitution, uh -huh. so it's very, very special. Yeah. And it's an all expenses paid trip by Dan and Lillian King Foundation. Okay, thank you. So we, that. with appreciation. Um, did we, we have a motion yet? No, we already voted, no, right? I, no, I have, no, we haven't done a motion or a second. Yet. Okay, I'll okay. make a motion uh, to support okay. this. Thank you. Second. <laughs> yeah, then first and second. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, 9.8 Student Connection PBIS. This is an important one. And this is by Kristen Schaus, Assistant Superintendent, Secondary Education. And I have our coordinator of student services, Greg Fry, with me as well this evening. 
A uh, couple of pieces I wanted to, to clarify. So there was an action that took place a little bit early this evening. I wanted to clarify my actions in that. Um, I actually did walk out with Brandon, who spoke earlier about the SELPA pieces that were going on. I did that so that we could get his contact information, which I've already passed off to Casey as well for the task force. Um, I've done that in the past with other groups. I did it with our soccer group as well as our CSEA members. So I just wanted to, to bring clarity to the actions um, of me stepping out to, to Brandon to get that info. So we'll move into to the student connection. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, uh, Board President. Uh, as you said, really important topic for us, so looking mm -hmm. at student connection. Uh, Mr. Fry is going to start us off in reminding us of, of some needs that we have had with tying those knots of student connection and then some things that we're embarking on and some awards that we're actually receiving too. Thank you and good evening Dr. Rodriguez, President Osmondson and the Board of Trustees. Um, just the, the, do I have a clicker? Oh, right here. Um, to start with the why, we'd like to start with the why of what we're doing uh, around student connection and the importance of it. And the, the research is clear, I won't go through everything, but the research is clear that students who feel connected to school have improved outcomes socially, behaviorally, emotionally, and academically. And interestingly, um, students who feel connected, um, even if it's later in, in their school time, they still have these improved outcomes. So even if it's later. So our goal here is to really systematize and put in place some, some actions that are going to be improving student connection across the board from an early age. So this slide is about uh, PBIS. PBIS is Positive Behavior Intervention Supports. Um, it is a multi-tiered system. We have the three tiers. And what you see here, um, some of the work we're going to be doing um, with all the school sites is around these three tiers. Tier one is for all students. It's really putting in positive behavior supports, interventions that are good for all students. And the research shows about between 80 and 90 percent of all students will, will respond to whatever's put in place. And, and there, this TFI, tiered fidelity inventory, is a way for structuring and systematizing and organizing, reinforcing positive behavior and recognizing positive behavior. So that tier one piece for everyone has these 15 sections that the schools will be working through. Um, tier two has 13 items, tier three has uh, 17 items. And all of these are around the areas of, of developing a team on site, um, implementation of positive behavior, interventions and supports, and then evaluation, how are we doing? To highlight some of the work that had been done last year, um, these eight schools received a, a PBS award. These are rec uh, state recognition. Um, and there's various levels starting at bronze, um, going on silver and then gold and platinum. Um, silver awards included Ann Solo, Starlight, Watsonville High, and Aptos High. And, our and those are the biggest ones? Those are the highest ones? In our district. Yeah. The highest one. The target. silver. Yeah. Those are yeah. that silver. There are two <laughs> levels that we are going to be working towards um, <laughs> that are higher, gold and platinum. Okay. Our, our bronze awards are Aptos Junior, Rio Del Mar, Mar Vista, and Radcliffe. And our goal is 100% of schools reaching at least bronze level um, by the end of this year, which they're awarded in September of next year. So some of the next steps around PBIS is, um, and, and and Michelle will be talking about this as well, is it really uh, working over the next few years um, uh, on these areas, at tier one to increasing, um, using the data to make decisions about how we monitor, how we reinforce, what is actually happening in our schools. Um, tier two, really developing classroom systems that are that are uniform, that are, that are common, um, foundations of intervention teams. And finally, tier three, that we are really increasing our intensity of supports over the next few years. And I'm going to turn it over, Ms. Schaus, to you. Thank you, Mr. Fry. A couple of specific areas, as, as Mr. Fry's outlined tier one, two, and three, so depending on where a school site is at, that's the tier that they're focused on and working on. Uh, moving forward in terms of what those supports look like and complementary tools and resources that the district has also established would look like the following. So our PBIS coalition, as you recall, in spring we sent one of the largest contingents to NorCal Symposium. We had over 55 folks there. Um, we are doing that again with the state-led conference. Uh, we also have Watsonville High with uh, Chrissy McLean 
actually presenting and co-presenting with me at that conference as well. Uh, so we definitely have some pieces to highlight. We'll take over uh, 60 folks. What we've asked for is a site administrator or whoever's in charge of their PBIS piece in addition to their lead PBIS on their campus. Uh, the next piece actually is an action piece that is associated with this, this student update piece on connection as well. This was related to, as you recall, the low performing block grant areas that we established in middle school. So this is an MOU piece specific to the middle schools in alignment with that plan. What we are currently working on, and this is kind of that way of getting our own kids involved in the process too, so we're working with Digital Nest, some of our, our alumni, as well as kids that are currently in our programs at the high school, they're actually helping to design more awareness around our PBIS programs and the, the class expectations, those, those banner pieces that need to be very visible on our campuses. Um, so they are working through that as well. It also ensures that there are common area expectations, so that would be similar to you know, what are the behaviors that we're expecting at the bus area? What are the behaviors we're expecting at cafeteria areas? Really, very much so, that visibility of re-engaging our kids and, and those pieces that they're looking at as they're waiting in line and those other pieces. This regional technical assistance piece, every region has a, a, a technical assistance associated with PBIS. Ours happens to be Monterey County. When we engaged at the level of what we wanted to differentiate for those tiers, Monterey County actually offered up Santa Clara County because it was outside of their bandwidth to be able to support us. So the contract that you're seeing is associated with Santa Clara County for the MOU. Uh, it includes four intense days of PBIS for all of our middle school teams. That includes six members or more. Those could be parents, teachers, uh, site faculty, as well as administration. Um, it also includes what Greg referred to as the TFIs. So those tiered fidelity inventories, do we have the same lenses outsiders that are actually, actually experts in this would have if they were to walk our campus? So those folks are actually gonna be walking our campuses with us and providing debrief to the site teams as well as in between these uh, four training dates, they'll be able to debrief what they saw so that they can actually shift and change what we need to have happen at the trainings as well. Uh, PV High actually did a nice call out for us uh, and preempted our, <laughs> our presentation this evening. So Five Star is actually a system that uh, we were able to, to get on board. It is, it's scanner based, it's reward based. I think uh, probably one of the biggest highlights that, that I heard from her as well is not only are the kids engaged in it, but it has teachers that get engaged in it. So, um, you know, as one staff member is issuing points to students and really kind of looking at it for, from that lens, the kids are then wondering, well, why aren't you issuing points to me? So it kind of gets into this little competitive phase of at least rewarding positive behavior, but then it puts people kind of in that position of going to the next level and saying, you know, I can reward for attendance. I can reward for turning in my homework. I can reward for going to activities if we want attendance at pieces. Uh, a big, huge piece of this, too, is that it allows us to desegregate the data. So any of our subgroups that we're specifically looking at, if we're looking at SWD, if we're looking at ELs, what if we're looking... Uh, students with disabilities. Oh, okay. So if we're looking at any of our subgroups, the data actually allows it to interface with ours as well, which then tells us which kids are going to what events, how are we connecting with folks, and which parents may be even showing up. So parents can earn points for their kids too. Who's going to open house? Who's going to back to school nights? What does that look like? So that we really can kind of increase that level of engagement with our parents and our kids. And then last but not least, another tool piece that is supporting the movement with connection uh, to the home, to the student, but also to the parent, because that's a huge piece on our student connection. Um, language line is uh, Minty White, used it previously last year. Uh, it did take off. Uh, what we did hear from other sites was that a barrier of not being able to communicate in, in students' language is there. So waiting for a translator or hoping to get somebody there was challenging to some of our folks. What we were able to do is basically put in a program. Language line's been used. It's got over 240 languages available. You'll see up there a highlight. So for Spanish speaking, it takes 10, 10 seconds for us to be able to generate the call and have somebody that, that has a three-way call. So it's not a disconnect of handing off information and expecting another employee or somebody that can speak Spanish to have that conversation. But a teacher can use it, a site administrator can use it, anybody can use the code for our district to be able to communicate with our families and have that actual third party piece live within that 10 second piece. Another highlight that we've talked about, population that we're trying to serve is Mixteco. It includes that as well. It takes a little bit longer, you'll see about a 30 second delay because they're actually reaching out. 
It's 24 hours, it's live, and it actually has a feed. So they get a little bit of context from the teacher or the site administrator, and then they actually make the call while you're on the line as well. So it gives more access to our teachers, our administrators, you know, our attendance folks. It really opens up a lot of language barriers that, that could have been there um, to, for our folks to be able to, to communicate more freely. And that's kind of what we've got in place right now with the student update piece. Um, we, it is an action item in the sense of the MOU piece for the middle schools, so you'll see the contract attached there as well. Okay. We have a uh, Kirkman. Radika. Oh, Radika. I'm sorry. Radika. <laughs> Good evening, board. Uh, I'm going to try and make this quick. I know we have all been here for a long time already. Um, I worked in a site that we had PBIS implemented, and um, while I believe that working on positive behavior is a really important aspect of working with students, you always want to focus on that. Um, this program is extremely data driven. Um, and in order to do it to fidelity, you are constantly having to collect basically data on anything a student does all day. Um, and I just, while I think it's important that we have that information and have that data, I just want to urge the board to remember who that work really falls on. Um, teachers are expected to be doing this on top of the job of teaching. Um, everything else they need to do in the day. So um, as we look at all of these programs and as we um, go to implement all of these things that look amazing, um, teachers are the ones really carrying that work and that effort. And so I, I urge us to look at other ways to support programs like this at sites so that not all of that work is falling on teachers. Um, we rarely hear of anything ever getting taken off the plate, but there is a lot of stuff constantly putting, getting put on. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Comments from the board. Kristen, how much work is actually put on the teachers with this system? I actually just wrote down that I would like to connect with her and find out what the site expectation level was. Mm -hmm. So, without speaking out of turn and not knowing the exact piece, I want to be very cautious of saying that. What I would say is that if it's done in a deliberate fashion that actually looks at OCRs, so an OCR would be a collection of data where a student is not performing well, not doing well in the classroom, it'd be similar to an office referral. That information is collected, so we do ask for information about how the, what, what was the engagement or what was happening with the student that wasn't successful, what was the location of the event, so we look at factors like that. That does similar to an office discipline referral that would be generated from a faculty member as to what that looked like. Uh, that's information, and this is the context of not knowing what the, the setup was at, at her specific site, so that's difficult to speak to. A site administrator at that point should be re re reviewing the actual OCR to see what that level of discipline or what that level of support would be. There are oftentimes teams that, that are formed. There is a PBIS lead. Um, that PBIS lead does have additional extra work, uh, work hours that they are doing. They are compensated for that work. Um, so it really does depend on how the site has structured that, but if they structure within the TFI piece, is it data driven? Yes, we do put in systems. The piece that has been used in the past that may also be being referred to is Swiss. So uh, realistically before we ended up with two systems of eSchools and Swiss. So we talked a lot earlier about the impacts of Synergy and being able to use one system to collect data. That would have required a site administrator or whoever was inputting their information to put it in eSchools and Swiss to get that data piece done. So we no longer are moving forward with Swiss as a result because Synergy can capture the same data in those reports that we would need to be able to move forward with state applications. Mm. Okay, so are teachers actually having to input this data themselves? Or teachers should not be inputting down. this data. Okay. Yes, which would be typical of if they're sending a student to the office, the administration needs to know what's occurred and what's happening. And again, I will follow up with specifics as to what that looked like. So I just wanted to ask, so each classroom has a PBIS lead uh, teacher that is considered sort of the PBIS person for the classroom or something? So each site has a, a PBIS lead. 
that helps site means the in, the, in the whole school, you mean? Correct. Okay. Um, um, there, there is absolutely an expectation with PBIS, that similar to what I said about, you know, setting classroom expectations, what we do in, so being intentional about how we, we teach behaviors. So when you walk into a classroom, have we been clear about what the expectations should be for, for our kids? When we're in the bus line, have we been clear about what those expectations are? So we do ask teachers and we do ask other faculty, including classified, to help reinforce those behaviors that we've set up, which are set up by their own sites as well. So how, I'm just, just interested, how is it that everybody classified and the bus driver, I mean, how did the whole site, how does all the sites get together about the whole PBIS process? How, how does that happen exactly? So it, it actually, we, I would say, made a larger push last spring. Um, what we did end up doing was bringing those folks together at the NorCal Symposium, so we had representation from all of the sites. That was an offer that, that we made and supported through the district funds as well. And, uh, and that the you had custodians, classified teachers? We did not at life. that time have custodians. Okay. Uh, what we do have now, and, and thank you to, to Ms. Powell as well, we have a very excited bus and driver bus who's, drivers. who's oh, bus involved drivers. in it as well. Yeah, bus drivers. Um, encouraging bus kids, driver. reaching out to, to kids. So we do have classified folks involved as well. Um, the classified that I would be referring to in terms of what that looks like on a school site would be your attendance liaisons, your office coordinators, your registrars, those folks. Mm -hmm. And okay, I'm just trying to like wow. what um, yeah. data is actually collected from the students. So similar to what the behavior pieces are. So what we would look for is how many hit kick pushes do you have going on on a campus? Have we taught explicitly other ways of coping with that? So you use the data of what the incident is um, in reference to, you know, do we have kids blowing out during instruction time? What would that look like if a student had multiple times that that occurred? So it really looks at the support level of looking at the OCRs and looking at those office discipline referrals that are coming in to establish do we need to go to the next support level, as, as Greg suggested, whether we need to move the student to an additional tier, whether we need to go to an outside referral at that point. It could be that we, we need to have the student assessed if it's early enough and it looks like there are some other factors there. So the main pieces that we collect specifically with, in the past, Swiss, would be what type of incident it actually was. So was it a violent incident? Was it defiance? What did that, that actual incident look like? Then we look at the location of where that's happening. So are we intentional about when we're in certain locations, what that would look like? When we're in a library, have we taught the expectations of what it looks like to be in that setting? So those pieces are, are crucial to what are the locations if we have you know, a middle school fight series piece that's going on in that. Where are those locations so that we can look at visibility, increased security, other pieces to help support kids in making the right decision in those environments. Um, those are the two main factors that, that we look at. And then what would be the consequence or the corrective measure that a site has offered that student? So, I was just gonna ask, so the... That is correct, time of day and date. So the whole connectedness feeling that when students are connected, they do better in every different areas. So it's, it's not just figuring out students that have some issues that need to be worked with. How do you, <laughs> I'm just, you know, I mean, I think the whole idea, I love PBIS, but I'm just saying, how does that, how did that whole issue of connectedness happen in all the sites so the students feel connected? I mean, <laughs> what, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I can understand the whole connectedness issue. I mean, I mean, it's it's not just looking at particular students and seeing you know what they can, but you know how could you could help them in other ways. But it's the f the students feeling like they're connected, and it ha has nothing to do with totally behavior. It has to do with them feeling good about. Well, I think that's school. the so that would be the concept is that what you're looking for is to reward positive behavior. So some of those pieces that you saw with five star, some of those tool pieces that are out there you're reinforcing a student. It's kind of like getting a paycheck, right? If you get a paycheck, we don't then come in and, and take your paycheck away. You've earned your paycheck because you've done those hours. So what we, we unfortunately sometimes do in our systems is a student does really well and we don't reward that behavior, but the minute that you have a discipline action, we go the opposite direction on you and take something away. So this concept really is, is that the student still stays at the platform of what they're at. So as they're earning those rewards and moving forward, things like the, the kids were talking about, and it also helps with the attraction of what they're connected to. Whether it's dance tickets at PV High, whether it's a yearbook at Ansolda, whatever those, those rewards and those pieces look like, the site gets to look at, at what is those connection pieces for our kids and how do we support that. Okay, so, and, and you would think, it, you know, in connections, 
how to connect with each other, how to figure out, you know, to feel good, feel, you know, good with your people that are in your classroom, you know, connect with everybody in your s school, in your classroom, whatever. I mean, ways that they can feel connected with other students and stuff like that, well, right? Yeah, it's positive interventions instead of punitive. But th what we're, what's before us tonight is a contract with Santa Clara or an MOU with the Santa Clara County Office of Education to provide certain services to us so that we can ensure fidelity to that we're doing the right thing um, in terms of rolling out and um, operationalizing this particular model. But it, right? and it's specifically in middle schools, isn't it? So PBIS is across the board K-12, so you have vertical alignment yeah. with that. But, uh, but as Clara. Mr. Serp is speaking to this, yes, this particular piece with the MOU would be specific to middle schools. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. This is specific, specific to middle schools. Okay, so. So is it okay to make a motion? Yeah. Does mm -hmm. anyone else have comments? I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero two. Okay. Out of the room, or is she gone for the night? Okay. She's what? Trustee Acosta. Let the record show that Trustee Acosta has left the meeting at what time is it? Ten. What time did she leave? Ten forty-five or something. Okay. And I'm not sure what time Jennifer Holm left, but she. Well, left she had to earlier. Though. Yeah. Okay. She had to be. And she left because airport. She had to go to the airport. Yeah, so she had a you know, reason to go. Okay, so we're going to 9.9. .9. Um, agreement between your futures, our business, and PVSD for career and technical education services. Christian Chef. Welcome once again. Uh, I'm going to bring up another coordinator that just joined our, our troops as well. So uh, Julie Edwards is our CTE coordinator, so she'll be coming up as well. A couple of highlights, and then I'll let her speak a, a little bit more specifically to it. Uh, this is in alignment with the CTE work that was already planned. Um, what we're really looking to do is use services that we know main highlights of this would be direct services of providing college and career expos at all four high schools. That would also include a career panel at Renaissance so that uh, their needs are served in, in the format as well. Uh, career panels would exist also at all six middle school slash junior highs. Uh, in addition to, we're actually extending it to an elementary school that may be interested in running something very similarly as well. So we're looking at identifying um, a principal as, as well as a, a staff that may be looking at offering their students that experience. In addition, uh, this direct service piece looks at strengthening our teacher connections to the actual industry partners. So a lot of times in our communities, it's finding that next piece of professional development that's really applicable to our folks that are serving our kids in ag, our folks that are serving our kids in health care uh, in healthcare industries to make sure that their industry standard is still met and that we connect folks with them as well. In addition to that, a huge heavy lift uh, of, of working through this is to not lose momentum. So we moved forward with bringing CTE in for a reason. We want to make sure that we get the foundation set as quickly as possible and that we keep moving forward on accelerating really robust programs. So there are some logistical backsides and some pieces to building out these events that come with a lot of manpower hours to do so. So what we're doing is going with a position of recommending that we work with um, your future is our business who already has these industry connections, who has already worked within our communities as well. Um, and what they would do is, and you'll see kind of that last place of saying, we're doing a one-year contract for a reason. It's with the intent that the materials that they build with us are sustainable for our own staff to be able to provide services to in the future out years. Um, we're doing that because they come to the table with a lot of resources and uh, having done a lot of the legwork to have these connections already so that we don't lose momentum in our programs and that we can start moving through looking at class periods, dual enrollment access, those additional periods that uh, we're gonna need to, to move into motion for all three of our schools for that, that equity piece. So board comments, uh, uh, and, and if you need to say anything, to, would you want to say something to us? I would just like to add that um, they're also going to help us to 
do our industry advisories and start to establish a work-based learning program, which is a, both our critical components of some um, of the grants that we have, as well as having a high-quality program. So, and they're, they're really the leader in our community providing these services. The County Office of Ed contracted with them in the past, and now that our program is ours, um, all the other school districts that have taken the program and also in-house have contracted with them. They are the, the... Who are they? I don't know who these they people are. They are a network, uh, well, they have a huge, huge repository of people that are willing to be in classrooms, speak on career panels, help with career expos, industry professionals in all different fields. Um, their executive director is Mary Gockel Forster, and she works with a UCSC graduate um, who majored, I believe, in public policy, and they have a network of interns. Bless, Bless you. Um, so they work with college interns. They have they have a like a, an organization of people that they can ramp up and depending on what That's what's great. happening. Yeah, Mary so. was our principal at Valencia. Yeah, when I first started there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. May, I'll make you. a motion to approve. Second. Well, I'm just wanted to add. So, <laughs> Michelle about this. So it's in, instead of doing internships, they're going to do externships, if you want to call them. In other words, they're, they're going to come out and to explain the business career paths, the, 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 the services to us, and there's going to be, they said that th there could be some job shadowing, yeah. career panels, job shadowing. So those are all aspects those. of work-based learning, yeah. Yeah, so that so. sounds really great. Yep. Okay, any more comments? Okay, do I have a, a second? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate <laughs> your time you. this evening. Thank you. Okay, 910, approve the variable term waiver for science coordinator. And this is Dr. Chona Killeen. Yes, thank you, um, President Osmondson, board trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I deferred this to HR Director Allison Izawa to present this action item for your review, as she can be brief and substantive. Yes, uh, so President Osmondson, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. As we had at our last board meeting, we approved the science coordinator, Mike Russo. And he's really excited to get started and we're bringing a wealth of knowledge um, by bringing him on board. Um, and so this waiver is for, because of the timing of the hire, um, his intern credential won't be until January. And so this waiver will get us through the time from now of his hire to when he will have an intern credential in January. And, and it's going to be to finish his administrative credential too? It'll give us the time, because of the timing of his hire and usually when colleges start their programs, it'll, it'll get us, um, it'll give him an intern, I'm sorry, it'll give him an administrative credential waiver from now until when he starts yeah. his intern credential in January. Okay. Okay, motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? So it's the one, two, three, four, five, 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 zero, two. <laughs> right, zero, two. Okay, the next one's about another position, 9.11, approve the appointment of Watsonville High School teacher on a provisional internship. And she's going to... I get, it's me go again. Go yep. ahead. Go ahead. I'm right. deferring. Yeah. I was going to say, do you want to <laughs> defer and then I'll officially take over? Yes. Uh, okay. So um, as we've been up here before to request provisional intern permits, we are doing so again tonight for a Watsonville High School teacher. Um, Isaiah Castro is um, going to be teaching English at Watsonville High. He was a graduate of Notre Dame de Namur in English, and he is also a Watsonville High graduate. Yay. Coming home to teach. Yes. Yay. So I re respectfully request an approval on the PIP. Make a motion to approve. Second. All the, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Five, two, zero, whatever. Five, zero, zero. <laughs> okay. 10.1, appointment and terms of commission members by Pamela Shanks, Director of Classified Personnel. Good evening, President Osmondson, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. Um, the Personnel Commission merit rules require that at this time of year, um, that I notify the board and CSEA of the commissioner whose term will be expiring this coming December. Um, Ms. Diane Bensberg has been serving as the CSEA appointed commissioner for the past four years and has decided to resign from her position on the commission. So her term will end in December. 
Um, the process to replace her, um, CSEA um, anticipates having a replacement name by the end of September, um, at which time I will bring that name to the board in October. And then within 30 to 45 days after that, so about a month later, I will be bringing a public hearing to the board um, in order for that person to be appointed to the commission to hopefully start in December after Diane's um, term expires. So this evening, this is just information for the board. There's no action needed, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, we're on the consent agenda now, and we've, you know, we're, looks like there's not any deferrals, so we can vote on it. Is there, um, is, can I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five, two, zero. Okay, we are done. And we have to do closed yeah. session. And we, the one, and the one, so Maria, you want to do the one expulsion? one suspended expulsion, I think. Yes, the uh, board approved with a 7-0 vote a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the 1920 school year with the placement on another school in the district on the strict behavior contract for student number 1920-001. A motion. It wasn't a motion. We voted during oh, we closed voted. session. We voted, okay, I'm just yeah. reporting out. Yeah, okay, closed session. My turn. Mm -hmm. uh, motion number one, closed session item 2.2. .2. I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on September 11th, 2019 with 62 and six additional items. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion number two, closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on September 11th, 2019 with 16 and eight additional action items. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We're almost done here. We're upcoming meetings. Our next board meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, September 25th. Here. Thank you. 11. Right on time, 11. I said 11. That's what I said. <laughs> you did 11. <laughs>